Hi, I'm David Foster, and yeah, welcome to the Typing Summit. So I thought it might be useful to present a roundup of some new typing features that are in the current version of Python that we have right now, Python 3.10, and the new version of Python that's coming up uh, later this year, Python 3.11. So just going to go through them somewhat quickly. Uh, first, I guess I should introduce myself a little bit further. Again, David Foster, contributor to MyPy and especially Typed Dict. When I'm not doing open source, I am chief technology officer at TechSmart, where we are bringing world-class computer science education to the next generation of K through 12 students and teachers. So, getting kids excited about coding. And you can find me online at these places. So. A couple years ago, or not, just last year actually, just in uh, early 2021, I wrote an article that um, was proclaiming that Python was in the middle of a type checking renaissance um, because we've had so many PEPs recently that are introducing new typing related features. And this year, 2022, it's no exception to that. So, as mentioned, I am hoping to in this talk to go through. Um, some of the specific features that are in both the current version of Python and the new version of Python 3.11 that will be released later this year. So let's talk about where we are right now with Python 3.10. We've got four typing related PEPs here. Um, a couple that are introducing new kinds of types. So param, spec, and type guard. There's other types of notation that's been added. And um, one theme that I think is recurring is eliminating imports required from the typing module itself, which makes typing annotations more easy to use. So just to go through some of these briefly, I'll show some, an example of code before the introduction of the feature and what you can do after the feature. In 3.10, the first thing I have up is param spec, which is particularly useful for annotating decorators. Um, before it was difficult to annotate, annotate the types of parameters that you put into a callable in particular. The dot 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 that I have here is actually what you write. Dot dot dot, it's not a placeholder. The type checker isn't able to understand in this case that there's an association between the uh, input callables parameters and the output callables parameters. But if you introduce a param spec, you can use that as a placeholder for any set of parameters. And so then it becomes possible to have this decorator nicely typed, which has been a problem for some time. So you can do that now. Moving on, type guard. So this is particularly common in uh, JavaScript, but also happens in Python where you have a function that is used to check whether something is of a particular property that a type checker can't figure out. So in this case, I have an example of a function that checks whether something is a list of strings. So, so we have a function that just returns a bool here, which is okay, but um, it would be nice that if you called this function and it returned true, that a type checker could narrow the type of the thing that you pass to this function to be a stir of list. And with type card, you can do that. If you set the return type to type card list of stir, you return true, narrowing happens. Beautiful. Moving on, type alias. So in Python, we've had the ability to define type aliases for a long time implicitly by assigning a, um, effectively a type expression to a variable. And then that is interpreted by type checkers as a type alias. However, there are cases where you want to be explicit that that's actually what you're doing. And at the moment, if you do something very similar, which is you assign a stringified type expression to a variable, a type checker will not be able to figure out that you actually wanted to make a type alias there. So now with type alias, you can make the otherwise implicit alias is explicit, and you can now use forward references for stringified uh, references, which is useful. So 
That's kind of cool. Next up, uh, one of my favorites is the ability to write union types and optional types, which is a, a variable or the constant none using the pipe operator. So this eliminates a few typing imports from the typing module. So no more import from typing module, and you don't have to type as much either because instead of writing union, you can use a pipe. Instead of writing optional, you can just say pipe none. Works great, is explicit. So that's Python 3.10. That's what we have access to today in the final release. There is also Python 3.11, which is just about to enter its first beta, I believe, either today or tomorrow. And I heard a clarification. Next week. Next week, okay, 3.10 beta 1 next week. So these types of types are now available. So we have, let's see, one, two, three, four, five peps here. So I'll just briefly go through those as well. So let's talk about literal string. So there are a number of APIs that expect some kind of fixed format string, a command string of some kind. And in the documentation for such APIs, they may say that you really should just use like a string literal, but there's no way for it to actually enforce that because that's just in the documentation. So common cases, you have something that's running like a SQL command, or as a second example, I'll show you in a moment, uh, if you're writing a format string to a logging function. Um, so right now, there's no way to tell a type checker that this string that you're passing in should be a literal. But with a literal string, you can actually annotate it um, that there should be specifically a literal passed in. And if you don't do that, a type checker will tell you that that's that's no good. So that's pretty cool. So you can avoid command injection for people who use APIs with literal string who also are running type checkers on their code base. And for many large code bases, this is already done. So as mentioned, there's a second example here of uh, formatting strings, which is another type of command string. And uh, in particular, we had a an issue recently with log4j, where you had uh, some unexpected use of things in command strings, um, and that would be harder to exploit if you had something like this used to type annotate a function expecting a format string. So that's literal string. Uh, type var tuple. So this is interesting. So there are a couple of libraries that define array-like classes. So NumPy's ND array class, TensorFlow's tensor class. In, there are many cases where you know, the data inside these has either a particular set of expected uh, data types or dimensions. And right now, the only way that you can, right now you can only put that information in comments and documentation. It's not enforceable automatically in any way. So here I've just got a comment here that's saying like this is a image and it happens to have a height and width as its dimensions here. But with a type var tuple, you can define um, array types that you can just give generic properties for each of either the dimensions or the data types or whatever property that you think is useful to be enforced as consistent. So here we're doing, we can actually just say height and width explicitly. And because they're new types, um, it won't allow you to like mix them up. Like instead of height width, maybe you put width height. Easy to get it mixed up if you have column based ordering versus well, row based ordering. So that's type part tuple. Self, so there are a number of APIs that are written in a so-called fluent style where you have methods that um, on a class that return the same instance of that class after they finish, so they return self at the end. Before it was possible, although rather cumbersome and verbose, to annotate the return type of such methods to 
describe to a type checker that it's actually still returning self. Um, you can do that with this fancy thing with a type var. Well, now you can just do it directly. <laughs> so if a, if a function returns the value self, you can also say that in its signature that returns the type of self, and it will do all of that magic for you, which is great. Data class transform. So this one's interesting. So there are a number of libraries that define um, things like data class, model classes of various kinds. So you have uh, adders is an old one, Pydantic is a newer one, um, but there are many of these libraries that define classes that act like the built-in data class. And right now, in order for a type checker to support these various libraries, there has to be a special plugin that is written for each library and each type checker. So a lot of times these plugins simply don't get written. Well, now there's a way for uh, library authors who are making something like um, a Pydantic model or an adder's base model to specify on those um, sort of meta models effectively, they can add this data class transform decorator, which tells type checkers that it acts like a data class. And so then you don't need um, the, the definer of the meta model doesn't need to start writing a series of plugins for all the type checkers. So that's great. And last but not least, um, there is an extension to the existing uh, typed dict, typed to dictionaries data type. Um, previously, it was possible to define a type to dict, which is a dictionary with a set of a particular expected keys that have expected values, very common in JSON. It was possible to define a type to dict where some of the keys are um, either required and some of them where they are not required. You had to do this weird hack where you had one type to dict inheriting from another type to dict in order to mark some keys as required or as not required. Well, now you can just mark it directly. So very common is you have a lot of keys that are required and a few that are not required. So much, much simpler to write. So that is what I've got. If you're looking for more information for, for example, a list of typing related peps, I've assembled a updated list in that um, blog post, Python's Type Checking Renaissance. If you search for that, you will find that list of typing related peps, and you can get the pep links there as well. Thanks for listening, folks. So I've got like, I think, two, three minutes? For, three minutes for questions. Hit me. question was, are the features that I mentioned um, available in typing extensions, or will they be available in typing extensions? In general, all new typing features are added to typing extensions first, and they will work in any version of Python. Um, so yeah, you can use these today, even if you're using an older version of Python in most cases. So some of the things like Pet604, you sometimes have to lie in from future annotations, and that will break if you also try to use Pydantic. So PEP604, could you tell me the what that maps to? Uh, type union. Type. Type, type union annotation. Oh, type unions? Sorry. No, what was the runtime over versions of type? No, for unions. I heard many different Sorry, X-pipe Y. X-pipe Y? Okay, repeat the question. It, it wasn't a question, it was a clarification oh, that that won't work at one time, yes. so you have to have from future import annotations, and if you try to use, have runtime uses of text, that will break on this one. You can, yes, that's true. If you, if you have runtime uses of that, yeah. that's a little bit more tricky. You can stringify the type annotation in some cases, but then you still can't 
use them at runtime. You Correct. Try to resolve it, it will break. Yeah. Correct. You can't use it at runtime in that case, unless you're dealing with a library that knows how to eval them. But actually, it doesn't even work. It doesn't even work. Yeah, it doesn't work in that case. It does work with bits by magic because we implement the oh the yeah. over operator, but I don't ask it. I don't know what. Okay, that's interesting. I have a question on why we didn't support uh, none pipe x only x pipe none and whether that's something that might be added later because I am going to support it. None pipe x? I do not know if that works or not. It looks weird, but it's, it ought to work. Yeah, it works. It's implemented. Um, the operator is, it doesn't matter if it works. Oh, interesting. I learned something. Okay, so yeah, the question was, does we have x pipe none, but maybe not none pipe x? Um, apparently, from research here, both work. Got a question here. What are we going to get in 312? 312. Uh, let's see. So there are two things that I know about. One, uh, which is tentatively called either type form or annotation type. Um, that's something that I'm working on, which will allow you to uh, label the type of a type annotation object, which is very close to type of T. The type of T doesn't accept certain things like unions and a few other things. That's something I'm planning on adding. And there is a second one from that article, which I do not remember offhand. You'll have to go look it up for me. Do we have any more time? Can I ask a question? In the spirit of being controversial from yesterday, optional is one of the most confusing words I have ever come across in Python. Because optional X is not in data classes, for example, optional. Um, could we call it not required? Could we could we uh, replace it with required and not required? We're, we're counting it in favor of five now. Yeah. Yeah, the so the discussion that was that was made that was related to that, the, the thought was that optional was basically too ubiquitous, too deprecating. Um, so probably we're going to be with it for a long time at the very least, um, rather than either reclassifying the use of the word optional or um, going like completely eliminating it. That was, that was more or less the consensus that seemed to be the case. Uh, so, yeah, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Alfonso, and today I will be talking about uh, basically the work that has been going on around tensor typing in the past, what is going on now, what is uh, the next steps today, and overall, like, well, what is going on in the ecosystem. So, first of all, like, tensor typing is a very nebulous topic, because it really involves a lot of things and, and getting out anything that that appears in, in numerical libraries. So on the one hand, we have like very clear aspects like creating a tensor or getting a symbol of a tensor or doing some basic matrix multiplication or concatenation. And this is something that comes to everyone's mind when we think about tensor typing. But by extension, when we think about machine learning, we have uh, neural networks and, and layers there, right? And because at the end of the day, the layers are just performing tensor multiplications. If we are capable of typing tensors, we can also type like neural networks and do things like verifying that the inputs and the outputs of the layers in neural network they are correct at type checking time. And then we also have a wider range of operations that are a bit more sophisticated that appear nonetheless very often in numerical libraries, for example, we are getting slices of tensors, we are flattening tensors, we are doing broadcasting or some very popular operations like Armix, Armax, Armin, Transpose, etc. So unfortunately there is like there isn't one perfect magical solution for solving everything. Instead, we aim to solve this problem with a combination of tools. And these tools, like we can put them into three main categories: one, Aurelix, another table metric, another custom operator. And each of these tools contributes in a different way to solve this problem. So, yeah, Aurelix allows us to solve some fundamental problems. For example, it's fine in itself the, the concept of tensor, like as a class with a variable number of the parameters representing the dimension sizes. It also allows us to say that we are moving. Uh, 
like I mentioned, or for example, in the matrix multiplication, a dense arithmetic is key every time that there is some arithmetic operation in the dimensions, right? For example, concatenation and slash operation on convolution. And then custom operators are needed for those operators that uh, cannot be expressed any other way, but that uh, are very co common. For example, broadcasting. Broadcasting is all over the place in many categories, and it cannot be expressed with arithmetic or with other ones. So as of now, like, I think something to be very proud of is the huge milestone that have been achieved with respect to last year, that is the acceptance of L646, that now is available from 5.3 level. I think, well, we have talked much about this from in the past years. Uh, it's one of the reasons why many people started working together in tensor typing, so that this is already done. It's quite an achievement, and I think they are very good news. Then on the deparametric side, uh, I'm working with Radit on, on having a after uh, Radit for Boson, although uh, for those who want to try, you will know that this is available in Fires, in Fires or anything this from the very beginning, and it's also nice to have it uh, to show that it's technically possible to implement it and to get insights about what are the, the implications of an implementation. And then custom operators is a, a more ambiguous topic. There have been a lot of discussion about what other operators are important for typing. Uh, some of them, as I mentioned, are uh, broadcasting, uh, that is uh, very, very common, or, product, or the product. But this is already available in Fire, and there are other operators that I will be commenting later. So, what variables? Uh, here, let's take a look about what we used to have and what we have now. So, basically, before, uh, we couldn't express that we have a tensor of any number of dimensions. Instead, to work with uh, dimensions in tensor, we need to at most define, at least define a class with for every number of dimensions. So tensor one dimension, two dimension, three dimension, and this applies also to methods. So you need to overload for any number of dimensions. And here there's only one parameter. But if there are two or three parameters, you need to overload this uh, to a combinatorial expression that, that is crazy. Actually, like if I remember properly, Matthew created a library that was trying to use this idea, and at the end, that was the problem, that there were so many combinations that it would not be stood. But now, we have exactly what we wanted, that is to be able to express that we have a tensor, not a one dimension, not a two, but of any number of dimensions. And yeah, I think this is a very nice thing to have, and it makes it also very easy to work with dimensions later on. For example, uh, you see that now we don't need to be overloading, but as well that I was to express something that are not necessarily tensor specific. For example, when you define the method, you don't you don't pass a tensor, you pass a, a variable number of, of numbers that will be converted in, into a set of the tensor and vice versa. You can force it and you can extract the dimensions and put them into a tab. So yeah, having this like makes a big difference on what can be modeled and opens the doors to a lot of things. So yeah, once again, like having this is really great news. Uh, then type arithmetic. Well, now that uh, we have variables, type arithmetic is kind of one of the, the most uh, clear things that would open the door to support in many other use cases, especially in the quantum of machine learning. So type arithmetic basically appears anywhere where you need to do some arithmetic operations on the dimension. For example, if you want to concatenate two tensors, you will need to do the addition of the tensors. You want to get an slice in such a tensor, you will need to do the subtraction. If you need to do the generate like tensor with values in some range, you, you will do a combination of subtraction and division, or something like so simple as a duplication again with the one duplication. Perhaps the, the main exponent of what type arithmetic can be is our convolution. Your convolution have a pretty infinity formula when you look at it, but then you think more carefully and you realize that at the end it's a plain arithmetic. It's true that the formula is a bit convoluted by definition, but uh, it's pretty it's simple. There is subtraction, multiplication, division. So basically, we are able to support the arithmetic, we will be able to support something so complicated as this, no matter like how we combine it, like how many layers there are, uh, we should be able to verify that what is happening here is correct. And, and this is a, a challenge for, for humans, for programmers, because these formulas are so complex that you can easily get lost on them, so to have it verify that on part time is great. 
And then by extension, by supporting this, we are also supporting symbolically in the sense that uh, we are also capable of giving to um, variables that they represent dimensions, we are able to represent the, their expressions because this way uh, we, for example, can verify that uh, the input that you're providing to a, to a neural network is correct and you are not just passing like a, something that would fail at something. So how do these operators work? Well, at the end, the, the semantics of the operators are quite a straightforward. Uh, first of all, we assume that we are going to be using literal integers for defining the values of the sets of the dimensions. And then, basically, the, the arithmetic operators uh, are behaving like they would behave at runtime. So, literal 2 plus literal 3 will be literal 5, and so on and so forth. The only uh, edge cases that should be considered is how are we handling any, how are we handling him, and, and what well, this requires uh, some more discussion, but this one of the last details that we are covering in the talk. But yeah, that's uh, a simple summary. And then the other key part of supporting the arithmetic is equality. Because so far, like what they have been commenting doesn't look like that surprising. Okay, you have a system where you have two plus three and, and you replace it by five. Like, but is that enough? So it's not enough. Because at the end, you are going to be building all the time expressions in tensors that they are going to get equivalent, but with different expressions. And the problem is that uh, you will get an error from the type checker telling you, hey, like, for example, here you have a tensor size A plus B, and this other tensor size B plus A, so they are not the same, and your operation is not valid. But for us, like, it's obvious that they are the same, right? Because addition is commutative. But for the type checker, this is far from obvious. And this applies to a very wide range of uh, expressions that they will appear in absolutely normal circumstances. So supporting them is a must to uh, make this feature useful. But at the same time, we want to make sure that this is not going to make the language way more complicated because nowadays the only languages that can do such a thing are depending typing languages where basically there you need to provide a, a proof that the, there is an equality between the expressions and that's definitely far from the idea the vision that we have for Python as a language. So basically the idea is that we need to ensure that whatever we add is going to add zero overhead for the programmer, like everything should be automatic. And the only kind of advantage that we have is that we are limiting ourselves to a few number of operators, right? We don't want to express absolutely anything in the in the tensor, right? We only want to express a few number of operators, so can we optimize for them? Well, we can, and that's basically the, the idea behind the proposal that is to create a canonical representation. Basically, the idea is that if we have two expressions which are equivalent, they should be internally represented in the same way. And if we achieve this, then equality comparisons are trivial. So how does this work? Well, for the case of addition, subtraction, and multiplication, we can think about this as polynomials. So the problem becomes just how can we compare if polynomials are equivalent? And for this, like, we go through a series of steps that goes through expanding the polynomial into monomials, grouping them, raising zero, setting a total order, and with this we guarantee that if they are equivalent, they will, they will be represented in the same way. I mean, it's not that much that we know exactly how to do this, since you know, there are libraries that can automatically like check these properties, but I think in this case it's quite clear, like, how can we achieve it? In the case of division, it's a bit tricky because this is not just division. This is integer division or floor division. So this is not such a common mathematical function, and there is not that, that many rules about it that are popular. But basically, some rules that apply for integer or normal division don't apply to integer division. Perhaps the, the most obvious is uh, n divided by 2 plus n divided by 2 is not that. Uh, and here we have an example, right? Because 1 divided by 2 plus 1 divided by 2 is actually 0. So all these things should be kept in mind to make sure that the, the, the rules of the arithmetic are consistent with the runtime behavior of, of the corresponding Python function. So yeah, that's a, an overview of like the rules of equality. Here's just a, a brief uh, comment about some experience that I have had myself like, in implementing things to do with the arithmetic empire. So I was typing some part of ResNet, uh, this neural network in 
we fight he, and we'll go, there are many challenges that I'm not going to enter into detail about what makes it hard to type it. The fact is that at some point I could type like uh, this part of the neural network where there is a long series of convolution, convolutional layers. And um, if you remember well, like the formula for convolutions is quite sophisticated. So just imagine like doing this like uh, five times, one inside the other, the formula gets pretty complicated. But the interesting bit here is that if you look at the return value of the function, you see that the actual dimension of the tensor that is returning is really simple, right? And, and this is because the, the quality, automatic quality system is capable of realizing that despite making a lot of sequences of this complicated transformation, a lot of things can get simplified and overall like get into this very simple problem. So yeah, I think that that's a, a good way of solving like what sometimes the quality checking is capable of. Um, finally, let me tell something about custom operators. Again, this is like a broad category to put together like many different ideas that would contribute to, to tensor typing. But clearly, one of the most valuable is broadcasting because so far we have claimed that we could support uh, many operators in the uh, support for variables, the variable metric, but the fact is that the motion libraries, almost all operators have a variant for the broadcasting case. Basically, the tensor will match, then they do broadcasting. So to fully support all these libraries that do broadcasting, yeah, we will need to be able to express it. And the thing is that broadcasting appears in all the key operators, like addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, comparison, like they're all, all over the place. They all have a broadcasting variant, and being able to express this is super important. Fortunately, broadcasting is very standardized about its semantics and behaves the case should be the same in NumPy, PyTor, TensorFlow, so yeah, that's a, a good thing to have. Nonetheless, again, we have in broadcasting the challenge of making sure that even different broadcasting expressions, we, we can verify that they're the same. We don't want to be in situations where we don't realize that the broadcasting of A and B is the same of B because broadcasting is commodity, or it's also distributive, and overall, like, there are multiple situation where we need to guarantee that, that they are um, About other operators that we have talked about in the past, for example, I mentioned many times uh, the product. Basically, often you need to make the product of all the dimensions inside a tensor. For example, when you want to do a shape or get a view of the tensor, you are going to do this. It's true that you could overload a bunch of multiplications. Nonetheless, like, this is not the cleanest thing to do, especially when you have multiple parameters and you can start having like too many combinations. And then a pattern that appears very often is when you are removing a dimension from a tensor, when you are replacing a dimension from a tensor, uh, this, these operators uh, were mentioned by Pradit, by Pradit not so long time ago, and I remember he did some checks and there were like 40 or 50 or, or more different operators in Python, in PyTorch that would need this to express themselves. So this shows like how common this pattern is. For example, in Armax or Armin, that is something that very, very commonly used. You're expected exactly doing this, removing one of the dimensions of the tensor at one of the positions. Or, for example, when you're doing a task pose, by definition, you are transposing like two, two dimensions of the tensor. So you will be doing exactly this. So having support for this certainly will open many doors. Um, yeah, that's basically a summary of like, all what the, the key elements for achieving tensor typing. I think, again, it's, it's important to realize like the future step forward that has been first C46 and, and well, how happy should we be about the work that has been done there. And also to be excited about what was going to be achieved for the moment. So, yeah, that was everything from my side. Thank you very much for your attention. And Pradeep has kindly offered to uh, manage the discussions. And as you can imagine, we are not really going to be challenging and more things because I can probably hear you from here. So, yeah, thank you very much.
Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let me know if anyone has questions. Uh, so I just have a question about broadcasting. Could you just like what broadcasting is and why it's complicated at the tech level? Uh, so broadcasting means that you can have you can add tensors that are not identical in their dimensions, but are aligned along like, across certain dimensions. For example, if you have one tensor of dimensions um, five comma one, and the other one of one comma four. So they are not identical, so you might think they can't, you can't add them. But in reality, uh, libraries allow you to add them and get a tensor of type uh, of shape 5, 4, because it's like 5, all the ones get ignored basically, and you sort of collapse them together. So that's the idea from a shape um, point of view. So we need that, because without that, it will get really shape. So we need broadcasting to be able to support um, usual torch, uh, tensor operations. Thank you. So the easy example is like, if you take a matrix and add a scalar, it'll mm -hmm. just magically work, even though the scalar is not a matrix. Uh, that makes sense, yeah. Um, any other questions? Yeah? Yeah, for your custom function, so is your idea in the long term that there's like cons and cons of custom operators for specific functions? Yeah, so that was the fear that we had. Like, we, we need a kind of, sort of custom operators for each one. So that I like, went through all the uh, uh, Tensor function that we have right now, and there are white labels. So I'm sort of classifying then what operators we need for each one. So I found that remove, add, and replace that were the sort of main things that we needed. And what that would cover basically almost all the tensor operations we have. There are like a couple of niche ones which I don't think um, it's like um, it's okay to ignore them and say that we can't type them. So it's not like we're going to have that. to make this work, but it sounds like you're lifting the whole like context work system into typing, and typically, from what I know from like C++, I know this is a Python context, but like, um, you need a zero improver for that. So like, uh, how does the, I think you said orders monomials, is that how? So, if I understand your question, <coughs> uh, you're saying how do you avoid having a zero improver for this? Yeah. Yeah, so the uh, thing is for, Addition and uh, multiplication, you're able to sort of get a canonical representation for that, so you don't need to prove that these two types are equal. But for division, like right now, we sort of have a best effort kind of simplification. And if you have, so it's like if you divide, because it's integer division, and as um, uh, Alfonso mentioned, you have n by 2 plus n by 2, they're not equivalent to n, right? So in that case, we do have um, the equivalent um, expressions that. The type checker will not move it, so it's imperfect when it comes to division. So it's a subset. Yeah, there I would like to add that since the last uh, year, like I, I was kind of surprised by the power of SimPy. I think SimPy is the right library, and they have some specific functions for doing pretty much the same, but in the context of paradigmatic, but we can like change variables to to variables in uh, Cypher. And we, I think that they do guarantee that the integer division and quality checking is, is totally covering on base cases. So I think that from an implementation point of, point of view, this could be leveraged and, and make everything easier. Okay. Um, yeah, um, Yella, you're up next. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> now you mentioned your name. Yeah, David already told us about all the new paths in fact of people into that. There's actually a bunch more smaller features that we're also getting. I'm going to introduce those. Um, but we have all these paths. I'm not going to talk about them. Instead, what we have is reveal type, never, assert never, assert type, get overloads, um, change to final, and any is a base class. 
Yes, that would be real type. Um, but we started talking about this. Everybody thought the real type was already implemented in that point for it specified. It wasn't. We just, it was in NiPy. We all decided it's so useful. We're all going to use it. Uh, so we added it to typing 3.11. Uh, advantage of having the data about runtime includes that you can run your test suite at the same time as you're debugging your types. Uh, and if you're using it in education, you can run your examples with the real type in them and they will actually work at runtime. Uh, we have never. Uh, no return has been in the type system since pretty much the beginning. But it was meant to be only used for functions that never return. Uh, but every type checker basically decided we want the bottom type and we're going to use never for that. Um, to make that clearer, the quick with the data, we are adding never as basically an equivalent of no return. Uh, we recommend that type checkers treat them as the same in their internal representations. Um, but in error message, I would recommend you output never when you're on 3.11 or newer. Uh, related to never, we added the assert never function. This isn't actually a type system feature. You could implement this in user code just as easily. Uh, but it's kind of hard to discover, and a lot of people have to uh, discover it independently. So we're adding it to typing to make it easy for everybody to find out about it and use it. Uh, so the use case is that you want to assert that some code is unreachable, and the type checker can prove that it's unreachable. In this example, we know there's only two booleans, so if it's not true or false, then it's obviously impossible. Uh, and with this explicit assert never call, the type checker will tell you if there's a third boolean, uh, because Python switched to ternary logic, and you didn't update your code. The next thing we added is helpful for asserting that if you put tag annotations in, the tag checker actually understands them the way you intended them. Um, in this simple case, you put int in the tag function annotations, so obviously the tag checker will think that x is an int. Uh, in this case, it's of course trivial. Uh, we, a major use case for this is in type chat, where we want to test that the stops we provide actually result in the types that we think they result in. Because sometimes we do pretty complicated things with overloads and generic self-types and protocols and whatnot. We want to make sure that tech checks actually understand what they're doing uh, in the way we intended it. Uh, and actually, as of, yeah, go ahead. So I was going to ask whether, is it no off at runtime? It does nothing at runtime. It's, um, I think you just need it to do literally nothing. Uh, it's purely for checking that the static type is what you think it is. Um, it returns the values. Oh, right, yes, you need to return the value so that you can put in an expression and keep using it. Yes? Does this do an exact type check or a sub type check? So can I have like a subclass of bits? Uh, it's exact type check. Yeah. Uh, it's possible that you have to think more about the details. One thing that I actually ran into recently was. If you have two protocols that have the same method, uh, should that assert type thing do the same thing? And the way you implement the night eye, it doesn't think they're the same thing, but maybe it should. Yeah? What does a reveal type do at runtime? Does it print it out or just uh, it, it prints the type of the value. Okay. Yeah. And returns the value also. Right? Yes, it also returns the value. Yeah, that's um, one of the things we found out while trying to standardize is it's Everybody implements it, but not everybody implements it exactly the same. <laughs> um, the returning the value thing is what night type is. It's useful because then you can just put reveal type anywhere in the expression, and night type tells you what the type is at that particular point. Um, so that's the behavior we decided to standardize on. I think PyRite has to change the implementation a little bit because of that. At the risk of playing devil's advocate, did that, that code is going to show me enormously confuse new users who see that and they assume that they get a hard check at, uh, at runtime. It's possible, yes. We went over a lot of possible names for this function, and ultimately we decided that none of them was better than the surf type. <laughs> um, we, uh, we tried to make it clear in the documentation what it does, 
Um, if you have suggestions for how to make it even more clear, we can still change the documentation. One fun trick here is that the SOAP never does have a runtime SOAP, but the SOAP type does not have a runtime SOAP. This is true. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, it's possible. I guess I didn't want anything too long either, but check type. Check type to me sounds even more like you're getting your runtime type check. Yeah. yeah, I think we went over many of these <laughs> on mailing list and yeah, we couldn't come up with anything that could be better. Uh, I guess the last thing I want to say is we are already using this in type chat right now. Uh, Alex Way Goods added it for PyRite uh, last week, I think. Yep. And NightPy, I added it to NightPy, we just released support, so we're going to have NightPy assert type checks in type chat also very soon. If the Pyre people want Pyre to uh, do the same thing, please contribute and save the PyTech. Uh, yeah. I, I think one thing that's worth saying about that is the naming is just the use cases for this are mostly for implementers and type checkers are a very complicated type library, so it's not the kind of thing that's likely to show up in code that you get into C. Yeah, I guess the name basically is you see it in, you look at the typing documentation, you see it, and you don't know what it's for. That's your guide that most people want to see it very much. Yeah. So this is a feature of Python right now? Is it um, yeah, so it's in typing.py at runtime. It's in 3.11, it's in typing extensions. But obviously, the runtime just uh, I guess we established it just returns the value. The interesting implementation is in type checkers. Mm -hmm. uh, and NightPy and PyRite support it. I believe PyTech already supported it on the disk name. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, we support a PyTech extension, not the search type. I think we need to just like alias this to something detecting. Okay, yeah. All right, uh, that's a search type. Uh, unless I have more questions. Then, but the next thing we have is around uh, support for runtime use of typing. The way app overload was, in, was implemented, uh, it would just completely throw away the overloads after the actual function is defined. So in this example, uh, before 3.11, the overloaded for a function for f, you'd just never be able to get it again because it's lost in the one namespace and there's no more reference to it. Uh, and this means that it was impossible for step, uh, type checkers that look at their runtime types to ever find an overload back. Um, so we added something that registers the overload in uh, basically a dictionary in the typing module at runtime uh, so that you can then call the get overloads function to uh, retrieve the overloads again and see what they are. Um, I was motivated to add this because in the type checker that I work on, we I need this to get overloads. Another use case is that in uh, in help outputs and other documentation, uh, we will now be able to show overloads because again they were completely inaccessible at runtime and you couldn't even find them. Yes, Carl. How does that work at runtime? Does it does the decorative stash it in some secret name somewhere? Or Could it, um, it there's just a dictionary in typing that. Um, uh, I think the way we end up doing this for module to function name to the list of overloads. Okay. Uh, the downside is that the um, there's obviously some memory usage because they keep these things around, um, and the app overload that is a little, little bit slower at runtime because it has to do a little bit more work. Uh, yeah. Similarly for final, um, also it was impossible for a runtime time checker to support not subclassing a final class because final just returned a class unchanged. There's no way to know that this class was decorated with final. Uh, so now we add this dumbler final attribute on the decorated class or method uh, when you apply it. Uh, I think this now means that all typing decorators are introspectable at runtime if you need them. Uh, last one here is a contribution from Shantanu. Um, we already in uh, stop supported subclassing any for cases where you have something that you can basically do anything with, but also want some custom behavior. Uh, the most common example is mock objects, which you can use to pass anywhere, but they also have some methods that are just uh, valid on bugs. 
so this equipment is that this will also be allowed at runtime. Yeah, and some takeaways from this include that there's still room for improvements. There's more things we can perhaps add. If there's new ideas that you think are useful, we can consider them for 3.12, or if we are really ambitious for 3.11 for feature freeze potentially. <laughs> Um, two days of sprint at conference. Two days of sprint. So if you have some idea, uh, come find me and maybe you can get it in the time still. Yeah, so maybe you can make people 12 even better if there's uh, more new ideas. Uh, and last, there is, as I mentioned, a bonus slide. Um, this is something that uh, Sergey Strachaka, who is a very active core developer, there's the DR for today. Um, currently, at the runtime, it's impossible to make a generic name tuple just because of some constraints in implementation. Uh, even though, to be at least, this seems pretty natural. Like in this example, you have a name tuple, one field is an int, the other field is the pen, depends on the generic. Um, so I'm inclined to allow this to work the runtime, work the PR, and make this support that runtime. My only hesitation is that maybe there's some reason in the static type system that this opens a giant hole, and there's some reason not to do it. So if you as a type checker maintainer thinks this is a bad idea, uh, please let me know, and we can uh, reconsider it. But Would it work with MyPy out of the box? No, no. Um, MyPy is actually the main reason I think it doesn't work. Um, yeah, I think MyPy, MyPy's internal tuple support just doesn't go generics at all. So generic name tuples are not going to work unless my guy changes differently. But I think that shouldn't stop us. Like, um, I think it's, to me, it seems like a natural way to extend the tag system. Uh, my guy, it's sad that my guy doesn't support it, but we don't have to wait for my to add it. Does yeah. it have any uses for runtime things like uh, uh, Python? Maybe. I mean, maybe. Do you use generics anywhere? We have generic version of models, yes. Yeah. They're scary because I don't understand them, but they exist. And people seem to use them. I have never used one in production, so I don't understand them. But like, suppose your classes are just classes, not name tuples, so that's, yeah. that would already work. It doesn't need this sentence. Yeah. So you're like, could, uh, could it be generic of many variables? Like the full game is like, could it be like x, y, or any generic? I think so. Yeah, I guess uh, I. If you are over this morning, I haven't really looked at it that much. I just added the slides ready for the presentation. But I think it should just be general generics. You can make a generic of your type for tuple probably if you really want to. Yeah. One thing I was concerned about is the variance. Um, should it be automatically covariant because tuples are immutable? Uh, what happens if T is contravariant? Yeah, I guess that's something for type. That's probably something that the runtime doesn't need to care about. I guess the fields um, yeah, can be both variants, but you can also have methods on the tuples, so then you might want a different variant. Like if you have a method argument um, that's generic, you probably want it to be quantum variants on the main tuple. That's a good Yeah. Um, yeah. Also, what does that potentially have to protect it? Uh, I know that check it still can't be generic right now. Yeah, the question is whether we do the same thing for tactics. Um, uh, I think there's somebody sitting near you who will have a lot yes. more things about tactics. <laughs> but uh, I guess the, the quick thing, at runtime it doesn't work. Uh, we have to add support for that. Um, and I think there's possibly more concerns about doing it in the tab system. But maybe Dave, if you have anything to add. Yeah, this is one of the four things that I'm looking at getting in eventually is generic type of things. So yeah, looking at that as a future thing. So you, you instan the, instantiate that this as uh, NT square bracket int or something, right? Uh, I guess that's up to type checkers. Presumably you, you infer from the and from the past in types. Like if you do NT one two, then type checker will infer that's an int. I think it should just work like any generic class. I will say I tried to use this and was surprised that it didn't work. And yeah, I just did something else because it wasn't essential, but it was surprising that you couldn't do it. Yeah, I feel the same way. Like it feels like it should work, but it doesn't. Yeah. Yeah, there's also like my file also doesn't support generic 
normal pupils, like not many pupils, just genetic pupils aren't able to program time. So yeah. that's not just around by the time. So yeah, I think you know, there's just I don't think that's the way these pegs are represented in night eye. The paths for generic and the path for tuple just don't back to work with each other. Are you saying that night eye doesn't support generic tuples? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so watch that in there. Are there any more questions? Yeah, for sure. For this slide. Yeah. For the final um, one. So let's talk about runtime usage. Like, if you mark a class as final and you try to inherit from it and like run your code, does that result in like a runtime error? No, it doesn't. It doesn't get checked by anything at runtime. It's just that this attribute is there, so that if you want to check it, it's there. Is it feasible now to add runtime usage because of this final field? Um, I mean, you could do it. I think it's. Uh, I think maybe it should be a different decorator because. Final as it exists now already means like that it's established that it doesn't get um, necessarily checked at runtime. So there might be people depending on that by and what they're doing. But we could add if we wanted to, we could add the decorator in the somewhere that actually makes it fast, not self passable. You could have it as an argument final in theory. In course. Yeah, I guess if there's interest in that then we could we could add that. I, Personally, I don't feel like a very strong need, but you can do it. Have you also considered the user methods? I know it's a little bit more involved. Yeah, it's also done for methods. I just put a class on the example, but um, basically the way final works now at runtime is it tries to set up attributes, mm -hmm. it fills, it uh, ignores the error, and it just returns whatever you want to need. Okay. Uh, I have a question about get overloads. If it sees a function that is a single dispatch function, would it be able to like read that registry of overloads, or does it only look at the ones that are? It's only overloads. Yes, yeah. yeah. um, yeah. Implementing this, I tried to generalize it to single dispatch, but we decided it's it's too different. Um, it's better to just keep it to just overloads. I'm going to implement something else. <laughs> Okay. The last thing I want to talk about with uh, named tuples is that there's also a PR uh, therapy that makes it possible to inherit anything uh, and make a named tuple. Uh, I'm actually inclined to not do that. Um, I feel like it would make it too hard to reason about named tuples in the text system if they can inherit from arbitrary non-named tuple classes because named tuples are pretty different things. Uh, but I'd also be happy to hear more opinions about that. I have a question about get overloads. You said it, it's like a mapping of multiple function name to overloads. Yeah. What happens if you had closures, like overload closures? Not that I've ever used this. I'm just curious. Uh, you mean you define the overloads inside a function? Yeah. Uh, yeah, they will get overwritten. Uh, so every time you do it, I guess it will create new overloads and put them in the same place. Uh, we actually, this was something we thought about a lot while implementing this. There's a concern that if you keep doing this, you just get unbounded memory usage because every time you do it, you get more overloads. So the way we solve actually that the line number of the overloads are the key. So if you define a new overload, the same line number, it gets overwritten. Um, this can have slightly unexpected effects with if you generate nested functions, but uh, we didn't think it was a better alternative. Yeah. So I'm guessing that's your thing of like in a for loop. I was actually thinking of like you have two functions. They both define the same closure inside of them with the same name. But if the line number is part of it, then I guess that solves that. Uh, yeah. I guess if the same name is in the same module, I forgot what exactly makes the keys be, but it's nice complex. Uh, I am ready. If there are more questions, I can answer them. If there's no more time, uh, then we can move on to the question next. Yeah. Well, so in regards to name people thing, I feel like there's been many times where I wanted not necessarily a name people, but just a an immutable no boilerplate struct essentially. Data class for data class. Yeah. yeah. But then you have all I mean, it's still a data class, so it's doing runtime stuff to check that. I don't know. I always 
Oh, I go for name people if it's infernal, and I don't care that it's a name people. Yeah, I guess that's it's kind of a style question. Um, I think we we don't want to add two more many more things to the name tuple because data class is generally a better solution. It doesn't make you generally into into a tuple and make you iterable, which is usually not what you want. Yeah, you can do it if you want of course. Can you go back to the reveal time? Uh, thing um, quick interruption. Just because we're running late, um, let's do a ten minute break. But maybe just if you still have questions, we can like we can stay and keep going. Okay. Uh, if unless y'all need a break, um, but yeah, I'm thinking we'll start the next talk at one. Uh, what, sorry, two thirty-five. So um, yeah, just at FYI, I don't want to cut this off, but I also want to give people a chance to like do that. Uh, hi everyone. For those of you I haven't met, my name is Rebecca. I work at Google on the PyTech Tech Checker. Today I am not talking about PyType for once. Um, talking about a possible extension to PEP 647, which is user-defined type guards. Uh, these slides were made in collaboration with Eric Trout, who is the author of PEP 647. He was not able to make it to PyCon, but he was a huge help in putting together this presentation. So I'm going to start with a brief refresher on PEP 647. We want to some criticisms of the PEP, to look at extension proposals to cover these criticisms, and then we should have some time for discussion at the end. So first off, what is a type guard? It's an expression used in a conditional to narrow the type of another expression. So if we look at this example, val is not none is a type guard that narrows the type of val. In the positive case, when the type guard returns true, val is narrowed to the non-none type option, and in the negative case, the type is narrowed to none. So what PEP 647 does is that it allows users to define their own type guards. So this case is stir list, is a type guard. In the positive case, it narrows the type of its input to list of stirs, and in the negative case, it leaves the type unchanged. So for some background on this PEP, it was inspired by type guards in a TypeScript. Eric talked with the TypeScript team a bit about you know, what would they have done differently if they could go back in time. And based on those conversations, he made type guards in Python as flexible as possible. There are no restrictions on the type guard type. So that's why examples as the previous one worked list of object to list of stir, even though there's no subtyping relationship there. So this flexibility does lead to some trade-offs, which is what I want to talk about next. Um, but to motivate this, I start with an example. Uh, so NumPy is a popular numerical computing library. It has this function called isScaler, which approximately speaking, what it does is it takes in a value that can be of any type, and it will return true if the type is string or supports float. So if you pass a scalar, a value that is either supports float or a numpy nd array, then when a scalar values to true, you know that it supports float. Otherwise, you know it's an nd array. So this is pretty obviously a type guard in the colloquial sense. But if we annotate is scalar using PEP 647 type guards, um, you'll see that a type checker would actually infer the wrong types. If you remember, we wanted a supports float in the positive case, an ND array in the negative case, and we would get these both wrong. So why is that? So in the negative case, the problem is that type guard does not do any type narrowing. So we are able to get rid of that supports flow. And in the positive case, the problem is that the type guard type is actually a union that contains this stir element that we should be able to tell is impossible based on the input type. But type guard does not do this you know, like elimination of impossible union elements. So, quick question, why doesn't type guard 
do these operations to refine the type. And the answer to that is that they're not always safe because a type guard can do checks that aren't included in the type information. So if you have a type guard that um, it checks whether something is a list of single character strings, then when the type guard evaluates to false, the input can still be a list of str. You can't actually eliminate that type. And Python type guards especially, there's no guarantee about the relationship between the type guard type and the input type. So it's even more unsafe to try to do these sorts of operations. So even though these operations are unsafe, we saw that there's an obvious use case for them. So the next thing I'm going to talk about is a few proposals made to extend type guard to do these things. I'm going to cover the proposals basically in chronological order. First show a couple of the earlier ones that were determined to not really be sufficient, and hopefully that will show why the final proposal is what it is. Sort of the first and most obvious proposal was to add a two-argument form of type guard. In this case, the first argument would specify the type generator in the positive case, and the second argument, the type generator in the negative case. And one sort of nice thing about this proposal is that it would actually give a way to express type asserts, which are functions that raise an exception if the type isn't, sorry, if its input isn't of a specified type. You could just put no return as the type in the negative case to show that it raises an exception. But as appealing as this proposal looks, it has a couple of disadvantages that were sort of considered to be deal breakers. So the first one is that it doesn't address that issue of not eliminating impossible union elements in the positive case. And that's just because that was a requirement that came up somewhat later in the discussion. And another problem is that for this to be useful, you really want to be able to say sometimes that the type in the negative case is anything but the type in the positive case. And this proposal does not give a way to express that. There's a last sort of minor thing, which is that it would also be if you have an unusual definition for type guard, different from other generic types, although that's not as big of a deal. So that brings us to the second proposal, which is just to modify the semantics of the existing type guard type. So say if you pass in a union type to a type guard, and the type guard type is on the types in the union, then just go ahead and apply type narrowing in the negative. This seems like a pretty straightforward change. Again, there are a few disadvantages. It doesn't address that issue of impossible union elements in the positive case. And also, this would change existing behavior in an unsafe way. You could have user code that's already using type guard, and you make this change, and suddenly doing the wrong thing. And the last concern was that you start adding all these rules for what type narrowing does and doesn't occur, starts to get pretty complicated. So that brings us to the last proposal, which is to forget about modifying the existing type guard construct, and instead add a new construct called strict type guard that does all these things that we wanted for is scalar. Apply type narrowing in the negative case, eliminate impossible union elements in the positive case, in order to make these operations a little safer, strict type guard would also enforce that the type guard type is a subtype of the input type. So this would be not a complete solution. It's also pretty complex. And strict type guard is um, already prototyped in PyWrite today. You can try it out if you want. But um, what Eric told me is that he hasn't gotten much feedback on strict type guard, good or bad. So the question at this point is sort of, is there much interest or appetite in this, like enough to move forward with the path for? No, and that's about all I have. So love to 
like selectively make time cards perspective. That might be too complex. Uh, I am just not understanding. So in this example, saying the narrative is too would be like in that first part Yeah, it would be type card that narrows this there and then it gets this thing. Narrows to that spot. And you would push the responsibility of having the use of the narrows. It's the hard part. I've actually got two talks here back to back. First one I have here is all about the future of types of dict. So just briefly, in case anyone came in a little bit late, um, I'm David Foster. I did the initial implementation of type to dict and I'm generally uh, shepherding uh, related features to it at, at this point. And uh, when I'm not in doing open source things, I am the CTO at TechSmart, and we are inspiring kids to code in the K through 12 space. So I thought it might be worth briefly 
reviewing the history of various features that are related to type dict. Uh, it was originally introduced with just a functional syntax, and then later on a class-based syntax was added, which I think is the kind that most people are using at this point. At the same time, we got the ability to declare type to dicks with uh, total equals false, which means that all the keys for it are not required. And uh, just recently, with uh, new PEP 655, we have the ability to declare individual keys as either uh, required or not required. So that's where we are right now. So there are a couple ideas for things to add to typed dict in the future. These have been proposed on the typing sig mailing list and in some cases uh, other places such as issue trackers and similar. Um, I thought that it would be interesting to just give a, a review of what these types of extensions might look like. And uh, yeah, so let's get started. So one thing that uh, is a bit of a pain point with type dicks is at least, at least with my pi, you can't have a recursive definition of type dicks. So common cases, if I'm trying to, uh, in this example, make a structure that's like a file system, I can't have a directory that contains other directories. Um, so, but if we were to add support for recursive type dicks, then this would be okay. At this point, currently, this does not work as far as I understand. So recursive type dicks. You'd think it would work, but, oh, I see a question. Typed dish. Like the JSON type, is that something? Yes, it would, it would make a typed JSON type um, more feasible than it is right now. There may be some other challenges with that, but it's probably a prerequisite for a better type on that. Do other types of it support this, or is it just in my kind of interface because that's my kind of doesn't support it? Does the type checker know? I do not know if other type checkers support it or not. I'm hearing from the audience that PyWrite does support recursive type dicks already, so cool. More things that we could do. So another idea is, um, so right now, a, if you declare a type to dict with a per particular set of keys, because the standardized uh, form of type dict in, um, I forget the PEP number, the standardized form allows subclassing of type dicts it will actually allow you to add keys at runtime to a type to dict value that aren't in the original definition. So type to dicts are open by default. But there may be some cases where you have, you want a more strict usage of type dicts such that, for example, with, um, in this example, we have a point 2D that declares only an X and Y um, key, but, at the moment, if you were today to try to set an additional key Z on it at runtime, that would actually work. Um, but you might not want it to work. So an idea is there might be some way to declare a type to dict as being closed. Here, um, just a provisional syntax idea is maybe use the final uh, keyword or the um, decorator on a type to dict definition, which would then mark it as being closed. So thought this was an interesting idea. Next one I up is something that's a little bit similar, read-only typed dicts, which is, so right now a, a typed dict is a dict, and because uh, dicts are mutable, you can change them after construction, but sometimes it might be useful to have a, um, a read-only type of typed dict so right now, the um, read-only version of a regular dict is called a mapping. So I was like, well, maybe we would call it something like typed mapping if we wanted this type of support. So I think this is kind of interesting. And another sort of 
Let's see, I'd, I'd have to review my type theory, but if because this is a immutable type, there may be something that can be invariant here that wouldn't be possible in other cases. So there might be some interesting uses for that. So the that's read-only type dicks. And the fourth idea, which was actually mentioned earlier during the summit, was adding support for uh, generics in type to dicks. So this is, for example, a point 2D, point 2D where you could instantiate it with an int parameter, so it's a, um, an xy integer coordinates, or you could instantiate it with float, so it's an xy of float float. And so, again, I guess this is actually provisional syntax as well, but it seems sort of, it seems like this is, would be the sort of the obvious syntax, and in some cases you may even want to have, say, like a type alias that is using um, these integer, or these uh, generic parameters, and then you could instantiate the alias, which would be kind of interesting. That's not something that would be a straightforward thing to support um, at least in my Pi, so I'd have to, so that would definitely require some thought on the specific syntax and then implementation difficulty and similar, but um, this does seem like something that may be desired, and it was even mentioned as I said earlier, so, so yeah, that is just a couple ideas, so I think a number of people in this room are probably already subscribed to Typing SIG, and these are just ideas. Like I'm not saying that like I'm personally going to implement all of them myself, um, but uh, I'll definitely provide some support. But uh, yeah, anyone who's uh, here and who's interested and or who's watching at some later point, um, yeah, love some help on making type dict better. Um, put some designs together, put some peps together, write some code, you'll be great. So yeah, I think I've got a couple minutes for questions. Alright, see one right here. Can you oh, um, are type dicks the canonical way to use some types in Python? Some types, let me think. I think, uh, so the question was, are type dicks the, way, the canonical way to do some types in Python? And I think that would be a union type is what you're looking for. Or union is one of the other. But like some type, I want to have like a some type include multiple things. Like some type just with more products. Well, product, no, sorry, our type takes the cloud away the product. Product types. So let's see. So a product type could be done with a with a typed name tuple, which is the capital form of named tuple. So that might be what you're looking for there. Then it's immutable, right? Correct, it is immutable in that situation. You could also use a data class, I guess, immutable. Let's see, I think I've got another minute for questions. So, one, one in the front. Excuse me, this is a dumb question, but is there a way to do, to declare the type of everything else you have? So, like, you said a, a Z in, a, in your example, everything else, is that possible? And if not, is it a consideration? Uh, so, I believe the question was, if you have just a regular type to dict, can you add Z on to the end of it just in the today's syntax? Can you restrict the type of Z? Can you say, like on kind of a tuple, you can say oh, blah, blah, blah. Yes, you can do this. So, so if you know in advance that there could be a Z key added, and you knew that, for example, that it needed to be of type int, you could use the not required key to declare. Okay, I mean, anything you uh, so you're saying, okay, so is there a way to declare that for any unknown key added to a typed dict that it must be of a particular fixed type? There is no current way to do that um, that I know of, and I don't believe, I believe there was something proposed on a typing sig thread that was like along the lines of this. Um, yeah, there was a thread about this. Um, it's possible to do uh, if we have You'd have to make it final to avoid a collision with subclassing rules. Uh, we would need a pet for it, and we need to figure out what's the best way to specify the type, which could interact with the rules for scoping on generics. But um, it should be possible if we have a use case that needs it. 
Okay. Sounds like this capability could be added, but it might also be a little bit tricky, so probably a pepper or similar would be required. So. If you're uncontrolled, you have data, the thing that works really well today is just nesting all the unknown stuff and it takes care of That's all I've got for this little, little talk right here. So thanks for listening for that, that first bit. So now I've got a different thing to talk about. So I wanted to give an overview of a number of tools that are in the Python typing ecosystem right now, which manipulate type annotation objects at runtime. There's a lot of interesting things that's being done here. So um, I just did a survey of all the ones that all of the libraries that are doing this type of thing that I could get my hands on. So it's probably worth saying as some background that type annotations were originally designed only for use by um, type checkers to use statically. And while the, the syntax for declaring type annotations has been a subset of the expression syntax in Python, um, and therefore you can actually get a hold of these objects at runtime, I think that originally um, perhaps runtime usages were not necessarily focused on. But because, because you can actually get expressions with types, there are uh, many libraries that have found uh, alternate uses for actually using these type annotation variables. So yeah, so the things I want to go through are um, several different libraries, several different tools that are using type annotations at runtime, sort of categorized by the type of usage. And um, I thought it would also be worth highlighting um, for those tools that are using type annotations at runtime, showing where they run into problems or challenges um, that are especially unique to the runtime usage of annotations that don't come up in the static case. So here are more or less four patterns that all the libraries I've, I've looked at are using. Uh, one is just straight up doing uh, type checking at runtime, um, like adding a decorator to a function to verify that its inputs and outputs are um, what are as expected. There are uh, beefed up versions of built-in type introspection functions that exist, which can look at not just runtime class-based types, but can look at things like unions, can look at things like typed dicks, so sort of I've written it as like uh, the enhanced version of is instance or is subclass or the type functions. Um, another thing that comes up a lot is related to the uh, stringification or unstringification of type objects. Um, in the case of uh, it PEP5 something something, where type annotations would become strings by default, um, this becomes five, PEP563. Five, um, this becomes something that would have to be dealt with on a more regular basis. You would have types as strings everywhere, not just as a forward reference exception or similar. So there are um, libraries where usually as part of their utility functions, they are either stringifying or unstringifying types. Um, and the last uh, area that I want to go over is using types when they're uh, parsing and formatting typed structures. So let's get into runtime type checking. So there's a couple libraries. I'm going to go over type card, pie types, and bear type. Um, type guard is specifically advertised for doing runtime type checking for functions. Pie types is provides a generic type checking toolbox, and one of its tools happens to be runtime type checking. And bear type is interesting. Um, it also does uh, runtime type checking. So all three of these 
libraries give some kind of type checked decorator that you can put on a function and then when you at runtime call the function, the decorator inserts some code to check the parameter types coming in and the return value that is going out. So all, yeah, all three functions do this. Um, the type guard library in particular has something pretty fun where you can install an import hook where it'll just add this decorator to everything within a particular module at runtime as it is imported. So that allows you to just like put these checks everywhere in a particular module very, very quickly without a lot of invasive code uh, modifications. So I think that's interesting. That's unique to TypeGuard at this time. I'll also mention that the uh, last library that I mentioned, BearType, um, also allows you to add um, new, new types that are custom that you can have logic written in Python to see whether something is of a particular type. This is similar to the like type guarded functions as well, but it's just expressed in a different manner. So this is kind of interesting. So this is an example of like a type that a NumPy array is a float. Um, it's worth mentioning that one big difference between these two, uh, between these three libraries is that um, in general, we have libraries that are just exhaustively checking the type. So if you have something that's annotated as like list of stir, it will actually look at the list and then go through every element in the list, no matter how long it is, and check that all of the items are stir. So that, that's a, that is a very correct way to check it, but it's also kind of slow. Bear type is interesting in that it advertises that everywhere its type checking operations are amortized constant time. Now the way that they do that is that, for example, in the case of Lister, it uses, just a, it uses a probabilistic algorithm. It just picks a random element of the list and checks that random element rather than checking all of them. So, so, that, so that's something to take into consideration um, depending on where you would be using these types of decorators, whether it's say best effort type of checking or whether you are depending on it, for example, for a security property. Like you probably wouldn't want to use best effort checking on a uh, parsing function that's getting something from untrusted network input or similar. So that is runtime type checking uses. I'd mentioned that several of these libraries provide either directly or as part of their infrastructure type introspection functions that are enhanced versions of similar functions in the standard library, except that they are aware of uh, a large subset, if not all, of the PEP484 typing hints annotations. So the libraries that apply here, some familiar faces. We have PyTypes, which is that type checking toolbox. Um, so it's sort of specializing in, in lower level things. RunType, which is a newer entry, entrant. TriCast, which is dealing with is instance specifically. TypeGuard and BearType again. The top three, the top three libraries listed here um, specialize in one or more type introspection functions, whereas the bottom two libraries um, specialize in other things, but they export their internal type introspection functions of this kind. So for example, um, is instance. All five of these libraries have some variant of is instance. Um, for example, TriCast, which specializes in um, is assignable, which is a version of is instance and a pass function. Yeah, so that specializes in it. And let's see, TypeGuard has a check type, but you have to, but it uses, it generates an error message with um, if it fails, so you have to give it some thing to put in that error message. Everything else uses pretty much the same signature. 
they do vary in whether they support, say, capital list versus lowercase list for generic lists. They do vary and they support typed dicks versus not. They do vary in whether they support other types of things. So these libraries are not all created equal in terms of like all of the things that they support. And as mentioned, bear type is a you know, probabilistic check as well. So you have to be a little careful with that under certain circumstances. So that's is instance. Is subclass is a type given a potential subtype and a potential supertype. Is this relationship actually true? So we've got two libraries that expose a version of this. Run type and pi types expose this. Sometimes with some caveats. And the last one is type. So the type function normally you give it a value and then it will give you what is, what is the type annotation object that describes it. Um, and PyTypes has a version that does its best to guess, especially for collection types. If you give it a list of all string objects, it will try to infer a list of str or a list of all integer objects. It'll try to infer a list of, uh, list of int. This is naturally speaking a little bit hard to do. Like if you gave it a list of uh, integers that are all of value one, technically you could, one type that could be used to write that would be list of literal of one, which would be pretty strange. Um, but I guess my point is that um, this is always going to be a bit of a lossy operation, a best effort guess, because type information is not preserved at um, runtime for a, a value that is uh, encountered at runtime. So this is always a best effort case. So those are all like type utility functions. Now I have libraries that are dealing with the problem of stringifying and unstringifying type annotation objects. So in this case, the way I think about it is you have type annotation objects that you are either formatting as a string or parsing from a string to be a type annotation object again. So in the case of formatting, the only library I could find that attempts to do this is actually PyTypes, again, that sort of collection of generic type operators that's just the toolbox. So it will do that for you. Parsing is a little bit more interesting. Um, I believe the only library that does this is TriCast, uh, because TriCast, when you pass it in its function that accepts both type objects, it will also accept a top-level string type. And so if you give it a top-level string reference to a type, then it needs to be able to resolve that to an actual type annotation object. So it has a library that it exports for that purpose. How is that different to get type hints? So get type hints, so get type hints works if you already have, get type hints will deal with string types in the middle. So if you have a list of string int, it can deal with that. But if you have a top level thing that is just um, a uh, string, it can't deal with that without additional information about an assumed set of locals or an assumed set of globals. Um, this, you, it, can't, it can't get all strings to figure it out, but it will automatically resolve things that are in built-ins, like lowercase list. It, I, think, I think it only will do things that are available in built-ins. So if you want to use capital list, you have to say typing dot capital list, and it will look it for a module name and import that. Um, and then it may not be able to figure out in some cases still. So best effort here. Correct. So it, it, it parses the string to find the uh, module first and then get that out of the module. And then once it's actually gotten it out of the module, it actually does delegate 
internally to get typing hints to resolve it the rest of the way insofar as possible. So, yeah, so I guess that's it for stringifying and unstringifying types. There's just a couple things that do that. And the last topic I have here is related to dealing with parsing and formatting typed structures of some kind. So an example here is you get some data off the wire. You're a web app. You get a, a dictionary off the wire, which is describing a movie. Um, Matrix is one of my favorites. Um, so you get a string off the wire. Typically, so this is a JSON string, so you use uh, JSON loads to get you an actual dictionary object with the stuff inside of it. And so then the question is, what, what next? So, you, so then you just have a plain dictionary object. Um, there are a couple things that you could do. You could, um, you could use a uh, typed dict. So then the, you still have the same dict object but then the type checker will tell you whenever you're using it improperly. Or you could use a specialized model class of some type, such as, for example, data classes, or you could use a pydantic model. And so the general goal is that you're taking something that is just a plain dictionary and then putting it into some kind of type structure that is either enforced at statically or enforced at runtime. So, um, and it's worth noting that all of these uh, typed classes, let's see, I've got, it's like I have three minutes left here. <laughs> cool. So, yeah, so all of these, all of these model-like classes use type annotations to declare what the expected types of the fields are. So because the types of fields are available at runtime, you can have libraries like Pydantic that will read those field annotations and use it to do enforcement of those types at runtime. Let's see. In so I mentioned that in general there's so there is a pattern where there is some kind of parse function and some kind of model class. If you have Pydantic, you have Pydantic models. If you're using data classes, data class is the model. Then there's a separate package called data classes JSON, which will actually enforce that information at runtime. The, there's the older adders package, which is similar to data classes. That declares a model type. And then there is a separate package called C adders, which actually enforces it at runtime. And then, I guess last but not least, um, we have typed dict, which already exists. And if you're using typed dict, that's interesting because that's actually the type of the dictionary itself. So you can just use an is instance effectively. You can use an is instance function to see whether it parses correctly or not. So. Since I'm running low on time, I will just show that this is how you do it in Pydantic. You declare a base model, and if you pass in something that doesn't conform to the declared annotations, it will fail at runtime. If you're using the um, strategy of using typed dict, you can use either, in this particular instance, it's easier to use a smart cast function which actually checks to see whether uh, something is assignable to the movie type, in this case, at runtime, and then returns it if it is, returns not if it's not. So this is one way to do it. Or you can just use a is instance function, and there's many different modules providing an is instance function. This is the one that's from TriCast, but as mentioned earlier in the presentation, there are several others as well. So I'm pretty much out of time. So I will just briefly put this slide up as some challenges that are there. Libraries don't support all of the typing stuff that's, that's done everywhere. Sometimes there are speed issues with checking, things like list of stir. Um, 
Some types of annotations are erased entirely at runtime, such as new type and typed dict, so that's tricky. Um, if you're dealing with pydantic, it will treat things that are actually strings, like it'll treat the string of one as an int, so it's looser than you might expect. Um, there's also the interesting case that is instance at runtime and the equivalent is instance from Pepit 484 disagree on a couple things, especially like booleans and ints, which is kind of interesting. And then there's ever the problem of string being also a sequence of itself, which is kind of bizarre. So that's all I've got. Thanks for listening, folks. So apparently uh, this was a topic that a lot of you wanted to hear about, so Shannon asked if I would talk about it, and I foolishly agreed to do so. <laughs> so that's why I'm standing here now. Um, I'm going to start with a brief history of how we got to where we are. Uh, the OG typing pep was pep 44, actually 43, but 44 was the one that specified how it all works. And uh, it said that at runtime, annotations are eagerly evaluated. So if we have this propagate function, the uh, names, some object, and none are evaluated uh, as the module is executed, as this function is being constructed immediately uh, to whatever they refer to. And uh, that works great in simple cases, but if we have, say, circular references, like this case, uh, we will get to this child annotation and not yet have a child class. So that name will refer to nothing, and we will get a name error, which is unpleasant. So PEP44 recommends that we should uh, put that in quotes uh, to avoid that problem. A similar case is the self-referential case, because the body of a class is executed when uh, the class uh, name has not yet been bound in the namespace. Uh, we also have to, to manually quote that type of annotation. Another case is uh, if, if you have ref uh, circular references uh, between modules, uh, that only involve the annotations. Sometimes you'll hide uh, some of those imports uh, using if type checking to avoid a runtime import cycle. And again, that name is not going to exist in the namespace at runtime, so we have to quote that annotation. So this all works. All the type checkers support resolving these, and at runtime, you can use typing.get type hints to introspect some function or class and get its annotations, and get type hints we'll look up these stringified names in the namespace, uh, the global namespace of the module, and resolve them to real objects when you ask for them, and give you back a dictionary of the annotations uh, resolved to real objects. But uh, as people began using type annotations more broadly, uh, this was just unpleasant. It's, uh, it's hard to explain to people why and when you have to put quotes around the annotations. It looks strange. It makes it look like types are kind of a a hold it on feature of the language. So people wanted to avoid this. And there was another problem, which is the eager evaluation meant that in a large code base, you could spend a significant amount of CPU time and memory uh, compiling and evaluating all of these annotations, even if you may never use them at runtime, because all you're really interested in is static type checking. So, uh, given all of those issues, uh, a smart uh, fellow named Ukash Lana came along and said, we have the support for annotations to be strings, so why don't we just make them all these strings all of the time and resolve some of these problems? So under PEP 563, you can uh, you say from future import annotations, and now, even though we don't manually quote anything, uh, these annotations become strings, and we introspect them, we just get strings back. They're never evaluated, unless we again call typing.getTypeIns, which is, as we already saw, is able to uh, resolve those to the real objects once the namespace is complete. This approach solves the circular reference problem. Uh, if we don't call getTypeIns until the module is done executing, all of the names will exist and everything is happy. It solves the performance problem because strings are very cheap, so we can uh, load those strings up fairly quickly. It doesn't have a, an extensive runtime cost. Uh, another nice benefit that it has is that once value that annotations provide is documentation. Uh, people want to know what does this function take, what does it return. Uh, the ideal documentation uses the annotations as they are typed in the source code. Um, uh, 
uh, an instance, uh, an example of a of like runtime documentation is the built-in help function. If you say help some function, it'll tell you about the, the signature of that function. And ideally, if you have, say, a type alias referring to some massive union, you would prefer for the help function to tell you that the parameter takes this nice semantic type alias name, not some massive uh, unreadable union. And it happens that annotations as strings serves this use case very well, because all of the strings, exactly as they were typed in source code, are preserved at runtime. Can I ask a quick question on, on that? Yes. Um, Presumably, the annotation still have to be valid syntax, right? Yes, that is a very good point. Uh, so with Net 563, the annotation must be valid syntax. It must parse. Uh, it does not have to compile, which is an important distinction that we'll return to later. So you can you can say it's a type of a module you haven't been imported. Uh, you can say it's anything that's valid syntax, and the runtime won't care unless you call it get typings, and then all of a sudden it will uh, care if it can't find it. Static checkers also here. It's true. <laughs> static checkers here doesn't exist at all, right? Uh, okay. So there were, so at first it seemed that 563 solved all the problems and made everyone very happy. Uh, as it turned out later, uh, we know now that not everyone was happy. Um, because people, as we just saw in the last talk, people do use type annotations for things that are not static type checking, it turns out. Uh, we saw many libraries in David Stock. I just have a few of them mentioned here, type card and Pydantic. Um, and people even do things like writing code in nested scopes in Python, it turns out. And sometimes they reference names from nested scopes in their annotations. And uh, get type hints is not that smart when it is resolving a string. All it knows how to do is look things up in the global namespace of the module. In this particular case, it will try to look up these two names. They aren't in the global namespace, and it will fail. So that makes Pydantic users unhappy. So, uh, Last year, when uh, F563 was scheduled to become the default behavior in Python 3.10, uh, users of Pydantic and other libraries said, oh no, you are going to break our code. And uh, around that same time, another smart person named Larry Hastings came up with an idea called F649. Larry said, it turns out that in Python, when we have some code and we want to delay its evaluation, we have this neat trick for doing that, it's called a function. Um, and functions already know how to like look up names in various uh, nested scopes and keep track of those as a closure or as uh, globals that's associated with the function, and all that already works in Python. We don't typically preserve code for later use as a string. So Larry said, why don't we do the same thing with annotations? So under PEP 649, every annotated function or class has a dunder co annotations attribute, which is a nullary function. And when you call it, then you will get a result dictionary of all your annotations with the values as the fully resolved objects. Or if you just access the done annotations attribute, it will behind the scenes call CO annotations for you and cache the result and give you back the same dictionary. So now this example works because the annotations are stored in the function, the function has a closure, it goes about the nested scope with the names in it, everything just works. So I can ask another question? Yes, of course. Um, before PEP 619, like, so we with PEP 563, um, what was preventing you from just like using get type hint to look up the actual types? In an example like this nested one? Uh, or just in general, I guess the nested one is still a problem, right? So I mean, in, in general, with simple cases of only referring to global module level names in the annotations, get type hints works just fine. Uh, the problem is that there people do do more complicated things and then want to resolve them around time and those more complicated nested things don't work. There was also a debate about uh, get typings uh, calls eval, so it's slower, but there's a trade-off because typings you're not using get ignored, but in theory it could be slower. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, yes. Um, okay, so PEP 649 does seem to solve, that does <laughs> not solve that nested scoping problem. Uh, however, it did introduce a few new problems that PEP 563 didn't have. Uh, if we look at uh, the data classes feature in the standard library, it is one case where the standard library cares about annotations and wants to resolve them in a class decorator. Now the fun thing about class decorators is they run immediately when the class is defined. So in this example with the circular reference among data classes, the data class decorator runs on parent and once again child is not yet defined. 
So all of this work that we've gone to to delay the evaluation of annotations is not very useful if we then go ahead and try to resolve them eagerly without waiting. Uh, so this is a, an issue that F649 introduces. Uh, now the interesting thing about data classes is that data classes doesn't really care all that much about what is in the annotation. All it really cares about is whether the annotation is wrapped in a class var or a mint var. The rest of the annotation it doesn't care about. Uh, and we'll come back to that point later. But for now, we'll just say uh, this is an issue we need to resolve uh, with PEP 649. Another potential issue with PEP 649 is that it is, it is less friendly to the documentation case or the live help case that we discussed earlier. Because you're only going to get whatever the fully expanded uh, runtime representation of your annotation is. You won't get the nice semantic name that was originally typed in source code. So we'll need to look at how we can resolve that. So that brings us up to today, where the future remains unclear. That 563 was accepted in Python 3.7, but it is now on hold. The steering council uh, decided not to make it the default behavior in 3.10 because these issues have come up. And so it's kind of in limbo. And PEP 649 is still a draft. So in order to hopefully move this forward a little bit, I'm going to try to present a high level comparison of those two PEPs along three axes usability, performance, and the migration path uh, to get to the final state. Starting with usability. Uh, we kind of already started this discussion, right, in looking at history. We saw what some of the usability problems with each of the PEPs are for different use cases. So now I'm going to talk about some things that have been proposed that could resolve or, or patch up some of those usability holes and what that would look like. So for PEP 563, we saw that it can't handle nested names and nested scopes. Wukash, the author of PEP, has proposed that we could expand this implementation so that it does track reference names from local scopes and keep around on the object some kind of closure uh, of those names that will be needed to resolve uh, the annotations. And then get types could be made smart enough to use these to help resolve the names. So if we implemented that, PEP 563 would be able to handle this type of case. Now, even with that kind of uh, improvement, there are still going to be cases where PEP 563 is going to surprise people at runtime. Uh, it still, ultimately, is preserving code as a string, which has no useful metadata around it, and then making a best effort later on to stitch that string back together with some namespaces and hopefully come up with something that works. Um, for instance, don't copy the annotation strings anywhere else to any other object and then later try to resolve them because they'll lose their main space and they won't resolve. And this might seem a bit theoretical, but in fact, the only two things in the standard library that really care about annotations, type dict and data class, both have this exact bug. Uh, <coughs> and it's been fixed in type dict, but not yet in data classes. So both type dict and data classes, in one way or another, need to take annotations from a base class and copy it over onto a subclass. And so they both do that. And under PEP 563, that breaks if you have a data class in one module, and then a subclass of it in another module, and you try to resolve some type hints on subclass, it's going to be trying to resolve the annotations from the base in the wrong namespace, and it just breaks. So this has been worked around for type fit. It could also be worked around with some special case code for data classes. But I think it kind of illustrates that with that 563, it's a bit working against the grain of the one-time resolution of annotations, and it's likely that this kind of issue is going to continue to bite people at one time indefinitely as they try to do creative things uh, with the annotations. Okay, moving on to uh, PEP 649 and uh, how we could address some of the issues with it. We saw this, uh, this case of uh, the cyclic reference in data classes, and as we saw, the uh, data classes actually has very limited introspection needs. So if there's only some way we could reliably figure out if an annotation is a class var or an init var without needing to worry about whether the other names in the annotation resolve, that would be nice. If you're observant, you may have already be asking yourself, why doesn't this break under PEP 563? Because if, even under PEP 563, if data class tried to resolve the annotations using get type hints, it would break in exactly the same way. And the answer is that data class avoids the issue, the issue entirely with a fairly unpleasant hack, which is that it just 
uh, looks at the string annotation and looks for literally the text class bar or a bit bar. Uh, and it's there, so oh, it's probably a class bar or a bit bar. Uh, and so it never resolves it. Uh, and of course, that can break trivially if you alias or shadow those names in, in strange ways. But it was decided that was a better trade-off uh, to avoid causing this problem. With PEP 649, we can't use that workaround because we don't have a string to regex match against. We just have a function. But there is something we can do. Turns out we can eval a code object, which is not as expensive as evaling a, uh, a string because we're not like parsing and defining the code. It's just it's a code object. We're just calling it in a fun way. And we can call it with our own globals dictionary. And we can make the globals dictionary a special dictionary that defines number missing. So that any missing name will just return some kind of missing ref object. And this is fine for data classes because, as I said, it doesn't care about all the other stuff in the annotation. It just wants to look for that class bar or init bar. So if we do this, so all the names that are there will resolve. Names that aren't there uh, will give us back an object. We won't get a name error. And then this use case works. So this behavior could be in a agility function. It could be in get type ins. It could be built in data classes. Uh, it's not something that it looks a little, a little ugly. It's not something that end users would have to do. We build it into the right tooling. But it, most importantly, it, it solves the data class case. We can use a similar technique. I might skip through this pretty quickly because it's a little iffy. We can, if we want to get annotations, the original annotations as strings, we can do that uh, in a similar way where we define some kind of stringifier class that takes a name and then if you get at it or get item it, it like puts together a longer string with the brackets or the dot uh, and kind of reproduces the original code that would have uh, that would have been written there. Uh, and it turns out this works, and we can do a similar thing where everything just becomes one of these stringifier objects, and if we do that, we can get back the original annotation, my alias in this case. So that's one way we could satisfy this use case under PEP 649. Another way we could, um, oh, okay, I inserted this slide at the wrong point. point. Okay, uh, another way we could is, uh, just say, if you want the original text of the source code, just go look at the original source code. Maybe a simpler approach. So you can just use inspect.get source to get the source of the function. You can parse the AST. Uh, you can use ast.unparse to essentially reproduce what that 563 does and get back the original text of those annotations. Again, this could be built into a utility function that these documentation tools could use. So that's another option. Another important limitation of PEP 649 that we touched on earlier and we should consider is that under PEP 563, type annotations must only be valid syntax. Under PEP 649, they must compile. And that's important because some people like to use new type syntax that's only been introduced in, say, 310 and use it on the 3.8 code base. And if they're using PEP 563, they can do that because it's valid syntax, uh, but it won't compile. So in a case like this, where we're on Python 3.7 and we're trying to use int pipe string, under PEP 563, this would work fine. Under PEP 649, it would not. Sorry, wouldn't that still work? It works as long as you don't inspect the annotations, right? Oh, sorry. This would work as long as you don't inspect the annotations. You're right. Yeah. Yes. Sorry. It, it compiles. It doesn't run. Yes. I, I'm sorry. I got that wrong on the slide. Uh, this does compile. It doesn't run. So if you inspect the annotations, this will break. Um, okay, moving on. Uh, performance. I added that slide at the last minute, and clearly it was a mistake. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay, so I wanted to look at performance. Uh, now, Larry has said that we shouldn't consider performance as the primary factor in making this decision because the important thing is to get the right semantics for the language, and then we can optimize them. Generally, I agree. I think that's right. It also doesn't hurt to look at the current state of the performance comparison and see what the starting point is for whatever optimization we'd be doing. So I wanted to benchmark a real production uh, code base with a lot of type annotations, like Instagram server code base. But the PEP 649 reference implementation is based on a 3.10 alpha. And getting any real code base to run on alpha at Python is impossible. So and I didn't have time to actually forward port the implementation. So instead, I did a synthetic benchmark, uh, where I generated a module with uh, 10,000 classes and functions. Uh, 
person zero, person one, and person nine 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 nine. They all look identical, but they're all separate classes. Let's build that for six six six. And yeah, it uses typing in a fairly simple, typical way that you might see type annotations used. So I think it's it's not a ridiculous benchmark. Uh, hopefully, I timed it like this using user bin time. Uh, just importing the module, obviously did a warm-up run to do the very slow initial compilation of that massive module, but what I'm actually timing is the subsequent runs where we have a QIC and we're just importing it. Uh, I did a bunch of runs and averaged them, uh, didn't do any fancy statistics, the numbers did not vary a lot, so I didn't feel the need. Uh, they were pretty consistent. This is where it came out. Uh, as probably expected, we see that PEP 563 has a bit of an advantage, both in uh, time and in the max memory usage. Uh, but the difference is not huge. You, you might expect, particularly the memory usage difference, to be more than that when you're talking about strings versus code objects. But actually, it's not a lot. Um, and another thing that's worth pointing out here is it, it has been proposed that we could put the annotations into a separate section of the Marshall data in the PYC file and only load that section lazily if the annotations are actually requested. And if, if, that, if we can implement that, that would essentially reduce the overhead for both of these approaches to zero. So it would erase any difference between them. Uh, in, in the question. case we're not introspecting. Um, do you know how these compare to like the e-evaluation pet four? Are they both faster than that? Um, they are both uh, significantly faster than pet 44. Okay. I could revise the slide and put the pet 44 numbers on, but I don't have them here. I didn't really include 44 in the comparison, because I think for a number of reasons, nobody is seriously proposing that we stick with either evaluation forever. Um, so I just considered these two options. OK, how am I doing? All right, uh, going on to the last question, which is the question of migration to, to reach uh, one of these end states. So a couple possibly debatable assumptions that I'm making uh, in this section. Uh, it is a bit subtle, but although PEP 649 and PEP 44 both resolve annotations to real one-time objects in a way that should look very similar, uh, in practice, if you rebind a name to a different value in a module, you could get different results from PEP 649 than you would have gotten from 44. Now, you could argue how likely that is, how common it is, how much of a problem it is, but it, is, it has the potential to rate code, which I think means that we would need a future import for 649 and a transition period, not just a flip the switch in one version and suddenly we have new semantics. Second assumption, which in my opinion is less debatable, but someone could debate it, uh, which is that libraries, particularly libraries that use a lot of annotations and have already started to adopt that 63, I think those libraries uh, need to be able to write multi-version code, code that supports all the supported Python versions without being forced back the PEP 44 semantics to do that. And what that means is that if we choose to move to 649, the existing PEP 563 future import has to stay in Python and keep working until the oldest supported Python has 649 available. Since the earliest version at this point that 649 could go into reasonably is 3.12, that means that 563 would need to stick around until 3.12 is end of life, which is many years down the road at this point. So we've been going for quite a while with two side-by-side uh, -side implementations available. Mm. <laughs> so uh, yes, given those assumptions, what does the churn look like of this migration and for whom? So th there's a very clear split here between different communities of users. For pydantic style users uh, who've never adopted PEP 563 in the first place, migrating from 484 to 649 will certainly be a less disruptive transition than 44 to 563. As we discussed, this, the way that 44 and 649 look at runtime is very, very similar. Uh, whereas 44 to 563, there's almost certain to be some issues, uh, even if we do the improvement for nested scopes. So that community of users would definitely have a less disruptive transition if we go to 649. On the other hand, for users of static typing who have started adopting 563, obviously the less disruptive transition would be to not do anything, to keep using 563. Uh, I do think that even for this community, uh, if and only if we can do the lax globals thing so that existing data class circular references don't start breaking suddenly, if we do that, 
I think that the migration from 563 to 649 for those users should not be too bad. Uh, in most cases, apart from things like data class, which do it, which introspect the annotations without you wanting to, most of these users aren't even introspecting annotations anyway, so they aren't really going to care. So. This brings us to the overall winner and the part where I cop out. Uh, so obviously, how you evaluate all of this, it really depends on what you value and how you weigh the different use cases and factors and communities of users. I will give you my opinion, which is if we assume that, and these are things that I do believe, that annotations are, yes, certainly at this point, uh, not only for static typing and for documentation, but that Pydantic and all of those other runtime use cases we saw are equally valid and equally supported use cases for annotations, if we believe that, and if we also believe that it's worth some medium term churn, like two competing future annotations for, uh, futures for annotations available for a number of releases, if it's worth some medium term churn to reach a preferable long term state, if both of those things are true, then I do think PEP 649 semantics are a more natural fit that integrates annotations better into the entire language, which is something the steering council has said that they want, uh, and will generally lead to less surprising behavior and bugs at runtime when people try to use annotations at runtime, and probably should be preferred. If we want to negate one of those two assumptions, either of them, I think, that would tend to point towards uh, PEP 563 as maybe a preferable option. And I feel compelled to observe that even if many people in this room would like to say that annotations are for static typing, that doesn't mean the steering council will agree with us. <laughs> so something to consider. So that's my conclusion. And I'm interested, very interested, to hear your thoughts.
the same as I did in the compiled link. In Rust, you can use a macro as your like ultimate escape hatch to get access to the code effectively. Yeah, I was going to say like I work in like open API generation space, and no language has as good support as Python does. In Python, you can introspect everything and generate primers in Rust. Every library is like a bunch of macros, and it doesn't support anywhere near as much as you can get in Python. Can we get anyone with Julia? Right, next version of this talk will have a survey of language. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Um, so you have a slide that suggested that with PEP 6.9 using um, new syntax from uh, later versions mm -hmm. could be maybe a problem, but it seemed unclear whether it actually was. I just sort of like want some clarification. Yes, that was the slide that I added late this afternoon and should not have added because I was just wrong. Um, so under PEP 649, type annotations uh, must compile. But in general, when people want to use new syntax, uh, I mean, if we, when, people, when we introduce new things like the pipe operator working on built-in types, uh, that compiles fine on older versions. It just doesn't run because those types in older versions don't have the under or method on them. So this would actually, work fine as long as you don't introspect the annotations. At that point, it would fail. So I'm, I'm Kevin, and uh, I work at DeepMind. We've implemented yeah, yet yeah. another type check. It's, it's not my type, it's something different. Yeah. Um, and, I, and so I want to talk a little bit about Python subtyping. Um, I'll start with subtyping. So Subtyping is really important. Why is subtyping important? Um, there's a PEP 483, which gives some of the sort of theory behind type hint, the original type hint PEP, um, defines a relation called is consistent with. Um, and this is basically uh, what some other languages might call something like assignability. Um, it tells us when we have a we have a uh, expression with a static type T1. Can we um, pass that or assign that to a variable with an annotation of um, static type T2? Um, that includes uh, parameters, passing arguments to parameters, and it includes returning values from functions with a return type annotation. And the first clause of the, of the um, rules for consistency is that a type is consistent with another type if it's a subtype. So if we want to implement this assignability check, we have to implement subtype inside of a type checker. Um, so that's why that's why subtyping is important. Um, the PEP 43 also covers the subtyping a little bit. Um, it's not entirely complete. Um, it doesn't try to be. It says that it's a start for the spec, but it's not intended to be a spec. Um, as such, it's not always clear what the intended behavior is of subtyping. Um, and another another um, drawback of using this PEP as a spec is that it's never been updated um, in the presence of new typing features which are constantly being introduced. So I list a bunch of things there that all depend on uh, subtyping or impact it in some way. Um, and obviously the PEP isn't going to constantly be updated to do those things. So what we do is, what we frequently do, is we'll black box test some type checker implementations to figure out what the intended behavior is when we implement a new checker. As a jumping off point to talk about subtyping, uh, I found a couple of conversations on uh, Slack channels or, or chat, messages, chat, chat forums that I, that I follow, um, where people who are experienced Python developers uh, or who understand Python types quite well were talking about typing. Uh, Hippo said, I think that the union of any and foo is equal to any. And Wolf, who is actually an implementer of a Python type checker, says that too. True. And then in a different conversation, Frog said, you should use any as a type annotation, which is the same as optional any. So I wanted to use that as kind of a jumping off point is what, what, what we're going to talk about. So focusing, so obviously, first of all, these, these people speaking don't mean double equal or same as in any sort of formal sense. They're speaking informally. But I did want to ask what it means formally in terms of subtype. And I'll focus on the second one. That is any the same as optional any? So from the standpoint of subtyping, they would be the same if they were subtypes of each other. Um, and so here's a little quiz. There is some audience participation. 
what is the subject relation between any and optional any? Um, if you think that it's that any is a subtype of optional any, raise your hand. <laughs> Excellent. If you think that optional any is a subtype of any, raise your hand. Yeah, some, so, some, that's, so there's some bulbs there. If you think that neither of these is true, raise your hand. Okay, so nobody's going to go for neither. All right. And if you think it's you, you think it's unspecified, or rather should be unspecified, that checkers should decide, raise your hand. And we have a few takers for that as well. So PEP 3 does have some rules for subtyping of unions, and I put them on the slide just to see that it's kind of dense, but I'm going to give an alternative definition of subtyping for unions. That is, um, this is pretty standard, that there's, there's two rules. The first one tells us, tells us what it means for something to be a subtype of a union. A type is a subtype of a union if it is a subtype of at least one of the components of the union. And the second rule, uh, so-called union on the left, tells us what it means for a union to be a subtype of a type. And that is if all of the components of the union are a subtype of that type. So in the PEP 483 definition of subtype of unions, a lot of those points were actually consequences of this more simple definition, which I claim is equivalent. So we'll use this one. And so now we can ask the part of that question. Is any a subtype of optional any? Yeah. Uh, maybe when we get to that, is, is X a subtype of that? Is, are we always, when we say subtype, are we always including itself as well? Um, I, I, I believe so, yes. <laughs> I believe we want that property of subtyping, yes. Um, so is any a subtype of optional any? And the answer is maybe. Um, we need any to be a subtype of any, or else any to be a subtype of none. Um, according to the rules that I gave. I think it's intended that this is, this is true because any is a subtype of any. Um, and I believe that it's intended that any is not a subtype of none. Uh, PEP 43 is actually not crystal clear about this um, because it's using just plain English instead of any kind of formal language. And it just says that any is not a subtype of every type, which could be read to mean that there exists some type T that any is not a subtype of. Um, I don't think this is exactly what it's intended. Um, but that's a sort of maybe a perverse reading of that. Um, and then the, it also says that every type is not a subtype of any, which could be interpreted to mean that there is no type T that is a subtype of any, including any itself. I do believe that we intend that any is a subtype of any, that subtyping is requested, even, even for any, which is kind of a wild card special case. Um, so can we observe subtyping? Is there any place where we can observe subtyping? And there is one convenient place where we can observe type subtyping. We have a rule for unions that says that if we have two components of the union that have a subtype relation, we eliminate the subtype from the union. So the example is that manager is a subtype of employee, and we will eliminate manager from the union. So I wrote a function. It's a generic function, generic in two type variables, t and u. And it takes a t and a u, and it returns the union of t and u. And I gave it an implementation because PyWrite was um, really clever about trying to inline and specialize this function in call science and type checker. So I gave it an implementation that would defeat PyWrite. And then I used a reveal type to show what the type of that is. And I used cast, which allows me to ascribe a static type to an expression, to ask what is the union of any and optional any. If any is a subtype of optional any, we would expect that what would survive in the union is optional any. Um, my pi says yeah, that's fine. And pi right says yeah, that's fine. So that is what I expected. I tested pi type and it just says any. Which seems to indicate that perhaps optional any is a subject of any. And there was some takers for that right, when I asked the question. And pi right says the same. So is pi type wrong? Is that a bug against pi type that we can file? And maybe not. Um, so I say reveal type is not standard. It will become standard, so that's good. Um, but maybe, but still a little bit unspecified what it is happening with reveal type. So perhaps pi type is implementing the union internally, and when it renders that type, it's only showing it as any. So it really has internally optional any, and it's just rendering it as any. And we saw that some expert Python programmers thought that that was the case. Those were the same. Um, so I asked a more direct question. 
what is the type of optional any, and it did show me optional any. So it's not the case that it's doing something different when it's rendering the type. So what is really going on is I, played a, I pulled a fast one when I gave this function union that was a generic function that took two arguments and claimed that it would return the union. It doesn't necessarily actually return the union. So the way the generic functions work is that at a call site, they're implicitly instantiated. We choose types for the type variables t and u based on the static types of the arguments. Um, so the static types of the arguments will generate constraints on t and u. We'll do some sort of constraint solving to find out what the solution to, t, to these constraints are. Um, and that'll be the answer. Parameter passing was based on consistency, I claimed. And so the constraints that we generate must be consistency constraints. So what we really need is that any is consistent with t, and optional any is consistent with u. Um, not, these are not, so that I'm saying these are not subtype constraints because, because assignability is based on this consistency relation. So one solution, the one I acted as if were, was the expected one, is that t is actually equal to any, and u is actually equal to optional any. But another solution is that those are both any, um, because any is consistent with any type. And so a valid solution to the system of constraints would be any, and I feel like that's, I, I believe that that's what Pytech is actually choosing. It's choosing a different solution. Um, another solution would be that t is tuple of int and int, and that u is optional string, um, and there's lots more. So because, because I put any in there, and any is consistent with anything, we can do a lot of weird things. So um, the, the punchline is we'd like to talk about what is the best solution to these systems of constraints, and we can't, we don't quite have the machine we need for that. So given that there's some weirdness going on with this generic function, let's just directly ask, um, what happens if I ask for the union of any and optional any? So we would expect that this is optional any. I, that was my claim. And PyWrite and PyTech agree. So PyTech is finding a different solution to the constraints of the generic function, but they both agree. Pyre still says any. So Pyre seems to really agree that those two types are actually the same. And MyPy did a really weird thing. Um, it showed me that the union of any and optional any was any and any and none. <laughs> so, so that's interesting. Um, so maybe that is a bug in, in my pie. And maybe my pie doesn't actually believe that any is a subject of any. <laughs> so by black boxing, I, I can't tell. Um, another way to test would be with a conditional expression. So we have conditional expressions. We have two sub-expressions. We would expect the type of this to be the so-called least upper bound of the types, the static types of the two sub-expressions. So the least upper bound is a, a upper bound is a common supertype, and the least upper bound is the least common supertype according to the subtype. So we want it to be an upper bound because that's safe. We want it to be the least upper bound because that will avoid spurious type errors if we try to use this somewhere else. And the least upper bound always exists in Python because we have unions. It's always the union. So there's always a least upper bound with respect to stuff. That means always the union. So we should be able to ask this question of our four type checkers and find out what they think about that. And PyWrite and PyType gave me the answer expected. MyPy gave me something different. And Pyre gave me something. Pyre is consistent with what Pyre showed me before, which is that things those are the same. And MyPy again surprised me because it's not finding the least number bound. It's doing something more like solving some constraints on some implicit type variables. It's the join of the two types. Me. It's the join of the two types instead of the union. It's the join of the two types. Yeah. My heart doesn't believe in the term. It's not like the All right. So, so Pyre said that, Pyre didn't believe that those two types were the same. So as Pyre writing, should optional any be a subtype of any? And again, maybe, uh, the frog thought it was. I conjecture there's no program where you can put um, any instead of optional any, or optional any instead of any, and det detect a difference in terms of static checking behavior, other than the string representation of error messages, for instance. Um, I've spent a lot of time talking about this one, uh, about, the, about that union of any. One more interesting question is what about the uh, union of any and object. Um, 
So MyPy says that this is union of any metric. Pyrex says the same. PyType says the same. Pyre says this is any. So it's treating any as uh, kind of a top type in the subtype hierarchy, and saying that any is the object is somehow a subtype of any. The PEP 483 actually has a, a line that's interesting. It says that there's a corollary that union of anything that includes object returns object. I think that might just be a bug in the PEP, um, but that implies that any is a subtype of object. Because by the rule, of, you would need that to eliminate any from that, from that union. But that's actually not ridiculous. It does have some nice consequences. So if we said that any was a subtype of object, then any would have the methods that are on the type stub for object in, in TypeShed. And we could specifically say that if we invoke something like, for instance, um, hash on any, we would get the return type int instead of any, which, which is not compatible with stir, so it can't be sadly convert um, cast to a string. So that actually might be something we want. Um, so that was all about um, any. And any is a really weird kind of wild card. So maybe you think that there's some, something weird going on with any. Um, and so there's a couple other cases that don't involve any that I found interesting. So what about tuples? So we have tuples. We have rules for subtyping of tuples. Uh, basically, a tuple type is a subtype of another tuple type if they have the same length. And the components are component-wise subtypes. Now, that makes sense. We also have variadic homogeneous tuples. And I think that you could obviously extend the subtyping rule to say that two variadic tuples have the same length as each other, because they both have no length. And that no fixed size tuple has the same length as a variadic tuple. Um, so I think there's an obvious way to, to extend this rule to include subtyping of variadic tuples. The question I wanted to ask is, what is the subtype relation between a fixed size tuple and a variadic tuple? So another little quiz. What should the subtype relation be between a variadic tuple of ints and a pair of ints? So if you think that the variadic tuple is a subtype of a pair, raise your hand. Okay, raise your hand. No takers for that. What if you think that the pair is a subtype of the variadic tuple? Yeah, lots of people think that. So there's no point to set both. What about neither? Okay, we have one person that says neither. Who thinks that this should be unspecified, that we shouldn't, we shouldn't know? Okay. So actually, I tried to test this, and it seems like all the checkers agree that there is no subtype relation. You put those in the union together, it doesn't eliminate either one of those. Um, and that surprised me a little bit. Because I actually did, I, I agreed with most of the people there and thought that there should be a subtype relation. It's safe to pass the pair where I expect to break out a couple. Um, so maybe what's really, but I do know that the checkers actually allow me to do that. So what might be going on is that it's a kind of a consistent, it's not a subtype relation exactly, but it's a kind of consistency relation where it says that the pair is consistent with the variadic tuple. So I wrote another function to try to test that out. It's a generic function that tries to force me to find a type that is consistent with two types. So x, x and y have to have the same type, t. So I'm trying to find, I'm trying to generate constraints to find a type that's consistent. And what I found is that my pi, pi right, and pi are all pick the variant tuple, um, which is very nice, and that's, that's a good behavior for type checking. So I do think, seem to think that they're uh, consistent. Pi type kept the union. So pi type found a solution, but so that means that maybe pi type does believe that they're consistent, but it found a different solution to, again, there's some system of constraints, we don't have a unique solution. Um, so, do we all agree they're consistent? So I wrote another function that would allow me to upcast from a pair of ints to a tuple of ints. This should be okay if, there, if I can cast implicitly up from a pair to a periodic tuple of ints. And everybody agreed that was okay. Um, can I downcast from the pair of ints to the periodic tuple? And my pi and pi rate said it's an error, um, which is, which is probably good, but they don't agree that there's a subtype relation, which is interesting. The pi type and pi are both actually said that was okay. So my interpretation is that pi type and pi are treating this as a kind of consistency relationship. It's not subtyping. Um, and that just like any, it allows implicitly upcasting and downcasting, um, though one of those is not safe. 
And then my pi and pi right is treating it also as a kind of consistency, but it's not allowing down counting. Um, and then finally, what about function signature subtyping? So we need subtyping for functions, not just callable. Um, and this is pretty confusing because we have positional only, named only, optional parameters. It makes it pretty makes it complicated. Um, you can write out all the cases. You can decide them. Writing a single rule that uh, determines if a pair of function signatures or subtypes is not that is not that easy. Um, so another little quiz is. What is the relationship between uh, a signature that, that has a pair of uh, um, arguments in stir um, and another signature that has a, a, int argument, a required int argument and an optional stir argument? So if you think that the signature with two required arguments is a subtype of the one with the optional argument, raise your hand. It takes a while to think about that. Nobody does. The other way around? Okay. Um, so nobody thinks both. Does anyone think that there's neither? Anyone think we should leave this unspecified? Yeah, so it, it actually should be, I think it should be. Um, and this is actually important here because if we do um, compatible override checking for, for subclassing, we need to actually allow this kind of relationship for methods, right? So I asked, um, I asked all these type checkers this question. And so my pi and pi type said yes, which is what I expected. Um, and again, I'm putting in a union and seeing if one gets eliminated. Um, but both with caveats. Um, so in corner cases, they're doing weird things. I have a pretty exhaustive test suite. So there's, there's cases where maybe the implementers of those tools think those are, those are bugs. Uh, pi right and pi both said no, but again with caveats. Um, too bad that none of the PyRite people are here because one interesting thing with PyRite is that it depends on which order you put things um, when you're solving constraints to a generic function, which solution it will choose, which I think is a very undesirable behavior. Um, and then the last thing about function subtyping is uh, what about generic function signature subtyping? So we have generic functions. I would expect that a generic signature was a subtype of all of its instantiations. So in other words, I have a function that needs a callable that takes maps a string to a string. And I have a generic function that takes a maps a t to a t. Um, I would expect that the generic function is a subtype of that instantiation um, so that it's safe for me to pass the generic function to, to, my, to my decorate function. Um, and so I asked that question. Um, so we don't have syntax for Unfortunately, you don't have syntax for a generic callable. And I selected, I, I suggested on typing sig that we use lambda. And then I put a smiley so everyone thought I was joking, but I was actually dead serious. <laughs> so, so it's exactly what it is. So we say that uh, there's a generic callable, and is that a subtype of the instantiation? And my pi says yes, um, which is what I want. And all the other tools say no. So. Okay. So what we really need is something that we don't actually have spelled out, which is something like consistent subtyping. So we need a, a notion of consistency, and we need a notion of subtyping, and we need to combine them in a way that makes sense for the Python, subtyping, sub, Python typing system to come up with something like consistent subtyping. So if we go back to the PEP again, we have a rule that says that a type can be a subtype of another. We have another rule that says that any is consistent with everything, and that everything is consistent with any. And this is pretty standard from what's known as gradual typing. But these rules aren't complete. It doesn't allow us to conclude that list of int is consistent with list, for instance, um, because there's no rule that lets us do that. So we have to allow that the type argument has some relation. Um, we also want to conclude that, and we have to be careful there because list is invariant, so we don't want to write a rule that allows us to conclude that list of int is consistent with list of flow. We don't want that. Um, we also want list of int to be consistent with sequence. Um, we would like um, iClaim to have a, to be able to characterize what is the best solution to uh, um, system constraints. Um, so we need something more than just um, subtyping. Um, so the conclusion of the call for action is that we should actually write a spec for what we intend to implement. Um, because PEPs are building on this already. Um, like, for instance, the very generic PEP. 
assumes that there's some kind of subtechnical relation between variadic tuples, and not only variadic tuples, variadic tuples that can have the variadic bit in the middle somehow, um, and we don't know what that is for sure. Um, of course, checkers are always free to implement anything they want, but they should be able to intentionally implement a difference of from intended behavior, and they should be able to characterize what that is. Um, and then we should be able to recognize bugs and implementations, and we should be able to pre um, eventually produce like some kind of performance testing. Yeah, that's it. Questions? Yeah, I'm going to go back to the contextual you had that optional any and any are always the same. Yeah. I think that's wrong because if a function that takes an argument of type optional any, then a type check should give you an error if you access some attribute that doesn't exist on none. Because the you know the value might be now. So it should tell you if you access something that's not accessible now. If the argument is just any, then you can access any attribute, so any attribute access should be allowed, but optional any should not be. Yeah. A, a good example of this is one of the get added overloads, or where if you if you specify none as your code argument to get added, uh, the return value in fact is optional any. So you have to like check that you don't have a non-reported view. It depends on your definition of like what should happen with you access the attribute of the union, right? We, I don't yeah. think we have that so, like, specification. So I, think, I, think that's a, I think that's a I think that's a good point. I think you might be right, and then I think we should write that down so we know that that's what we should implement. Um, it's also not just a matter of what we should implement, but it's also a matter of how we explain this to developers, because listening to developers talk, they actually do believe that they're the same. Um, so so I think you might be right. That my conjecture should be wrong. This was, this was again, the slide that um, I, I put in at the last minute. <laughs> but yeah, I, think, I think you could be right. We should, I think we should decide that that's what it is. We should write it down. Well, I'm curious what the use case of any is, right? Like, do we actually want it to be part of the type system? Because I think right now, Pyre treats it as an escape hatch, where it's like, I don't want you to type check things against this. Like, this should just be excluded, essentially. It should be consistent with everything. And it doesn't, like, if you join something to it, we basically say, like, uh, like it, since it can sometimes be any, you still don't want type errors against it. So in that sense, it's like a different application than just like an object, I guess. So yeah, so, so so Shannon was saying that what what is the status of any? Oh, I think there's different answers to that. So the grad, so the, the system that Python has seems to be based on gradual typing, and the gradual typing view of any or, or or dynamic or whatever you call that type is that it's an arbitrary static type. So at some point you could write in, there's some static type that you could eventually write in there that would, that would, that would be the, the static type. Um, and so from that standpoint, um, th so that's one view of any. Another view of any is if you just take a very naive set theoretic uh, idea of what types are, they're sets of values, and then any describes the set of all Python values. So it's a kind of top type. Um, that's what we did. Object. It's like object, yeah, that's what we did in Dart. It was, it was a top type, object was a top type and any was a top type, but any had a special property that you never got a static type error. Um, I think Python has intentionally chosen something which is a little more subtle than that, though, that it's not explicitly a top type with respect to subtyping. Um, kind of both the top type and the bottom. Mm -hmm. But why do we have the separate consistency? Right. So I would, so I would, so, so the, the comment was that it's both the top type and the bottom type. I would say that I think it's a top type with respect to consistent subtyping and, and, and a bottom type with respect to consistent subtyping, but not with respect to subtyping. That's the way out of that maze that we're in. Yeah. Please write a new version of that for a three. Yeah, I think that I think that I mean that's a that's a that's a possible way forward. Another path. Yeah. Then I, I know this hearing council requested one type piece so we could start putting together the specification. You have we made claim that we need this notion of like the best solution of constraints. Um, I was wondering like what you envision its usefulness other than the real What is it what is it useful to have the best solution? Yeah. Well in the sense we want 
a sense we want some order on types and we want to choose the least solution. What, but when are you forced to choose a solution? That's the like when are you forced to choose a solution? When you will, so when, you, when are you forced to solve choose a solution? Yes. So the way that the way that generic functions usually work is that when you when you apply the function, you choose an instantiation of the function based on the types of the arguments. And so at that point, you have to generate constraints and then choose a solution. Well, but and so if you choose a solution that's, you that's have to too big, then you can have um, spurious. Set. But if you want to somehow statically you resolve overloads, and that's completely unspecified. You're right.
So this this sort of this goes gets into the sort of the accusation that the, type, the typing folks, the folks who either implement type checkers or are heavy users of type checkers and want all the code to type correctly, have lost sort of touch with the vast majority of Python core devs and possibly Python users. Uh, I have no questions prepared. I think that uh, we, we had a sort of an email thread where we all vented about what kind of things went wrong between uh, some typing folks and uh, the uh, core dev team and the steering council. I think Matthew, I, I'd like to hear your ex a bit. Can you say a bit more about your experience with getting a big typing code accepted? Uh -huh, yeah. Um, so with PEP 646, Variadic Generics, uh, we initially thought, oh, this is just going to be this small thing that's like necessary prerequisite for other types of typing stuff. I mean, no problem at all, right? Like maybe a few weeks. Uh, two years later, it's finally been accepted. Um, so it's been accepted twice, right? It's been accepted twice, wow. <laughs> um, I think the, the takeaway I actually realized while well, talking to the other folks back on this thread was just the importance of like really aiming for keeping your patches as small as possible. Um, both, I mean, I think we both, both just weren't strict enough. We, we weren't strict enough about this um, in the first place, but I think also like PEP 484 set a precedent of like, hey, you're introducing a new feature, implement all the things. Um, whereas I think in retrospect, we should have literally just been like, hey, like what's the smallest chunk of this we can implement first? Um, and then go from there. Um, I'd say other than that, though, my experience was very positive. Like, I, I, I thought the steering council was very understanding of the fact that, like, oh, yeah, we had this last minute realization that there was a bug we needed to fix. And uh, the steering council did chat us a little bit, but we were very appreciative of, of the new participation process. And except for the second time. Um, so, yeah, my advice, my advice on that one is, like, really, we should, we should have a policy of trying to keep apps as small as possible. So, encouraging people who are writing apps to do that. Um, but, but, yeah, uh, yes, some members of the um, I'd like to say that the, the chiding bit, you had the bad luck of being the second one pep that came with changes after we started considering it. So we felt we needed, not for you as such, but for everyone, to remind everyone, don't waste our time. And we, I mean, it's not that big a deal, but if everyone does it, it does become a big deal. It's also because it's important to understand that to, to judge a pep, especially when you modify it, it, it's a lot of amount of time because not only like we, it doesn't work in a way that we go into the room and say, what do you think, what do you think, plus one minus one, one done. But it doesn't work that way because our job is not to decide ourselves, mainly that's the last resort, is to reflect what the Python community thinks. So it's literally going to all those mailings and like go email by email, making sure that we understand all positions, uh, what are the uh, different camps if they are, and to make sure that every possible you know um, complaint that people have or things like that are, is reflected, and if there is a last minute you know addition or change, it just, it just we need to go back and check everything against the new version. So it's not about like you know we are very important people with you know our time is great. It's also like it just doubles the time, and we have like a huge queue. So that's that's well, uh, not anymore. We yeah. have <laughs> we we have to work through it. Yeah, yeah. for yeah. now. <laughs> I'd like to invite Pradeep to say a few things about uh, your experience with a pep that didn't get expect, accepted after, I would say, a lot of debate in this group. Yeah, um, so that is the callable syntax pep. I think um, most of the typing sync community wants nice syntax for callables. It's the most complicated type we have. So um, beginning of like middle of last year, we all started discussing it. Huge debates, lots of um, possible approaches. We sort of uh, narrowed it down, agreed on stuff. Um, but then, then when we went to Python Dev, uh, we got some a lot of strong pushback in one thread like, towards the end, saying that um, it's troubling to see um, Python becoming more complicated for the sake of typing um, and like, making the language syntax more complicated. So I think from that point onwards, this is like a pretty uh, hard set. Several of those people. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, like I think one one question I had was, uh, what recommendation do you have for somebody like writing a type, a syntax, but 
Should we try to rope in more non-typing coded folks early in the process? It's hard to say because I understand the need for a lot of those changes is uh, from the type of theory, which is fairly esoteric, if it's fair to say. So it, for someone who doesn't care about static typing at all, or a type announced at all, or dynamic typing at all, for them to be pulled in and say, hey, what do you think of the syntax for you know, this use case? If they don't understand the use case and why it's important to, to be able to express those things, that's not going to end well. That's just, well, so. Even if they understand it, they don't care. Yeah, well, I mean, they have to put in the effort to understand it, right? Right. So, if, if there are core developers who are interested, then absolutely, if they want to. But if it's not, you know, if you don't find that, the core developers who are interested are, are probably already on the typing set. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. Well, yeah, you know what I mean? I think, I mean, I think there is like a, two sides of the story because like what happens probably is that in typing chic or I mean this is true for typing but it's also true for other and that are very specialized. When you discuss like you say okay we have this problem right and then you go to the specialized group and then you say okay let's find the best solution for this problem once we all think it's a problem and then you spend all this time and you iterate and it's hard work and you know like I understand how hard it is but then you go to the general community and they may actually have questions about the, the problem at, in the way of stack, right? Like they say, okay, maybe it's a problem, but it's not worth a problem. That is, uh, it's a problem that is not worth solving, or at least with new syntax, or the cost is not big. So, you know, maybe you are spending all this time trying to find a solution for the problem, while it may be that the bigger community doesn't think it's a problem worth solving with the cost that you're adding. And trying to find like a solution, or if that is the case, is actually very challenging because, uh, as Thomas said, if you go to Python, there you are now need to filter all the people that you know like, don't, don't understand the problem. And it's very, it's very hard for us as well because like, we need to balance both things. And you know, and, and, and many many people don't understand that you know sometimes they come with a problem and they say, okay, but this is a problem, right? And this is the solution. And this is the best solution. And then we say, yeah, yeah, no. And uh, they say, why? But it's the best solution because you know, yes, it's a problem, but maybe it's not a problem worth solving with more syntax, right? Or, or whatever it is. And it doesn't need to be syntax versus non syntax. So I understand it's quite hard. I don't think we have a magical solution. We we are we are quite approachable in the sense that you, you want to contact the student council for some kind of early recommendation or like maybe we say, for instance, a, a paper like the Collabor syntax that involves a lot of you know big changes. You could contact the student council and say think like okay, should, what what do you think is the, strat the best strategy here? Should I contact Python now? Or like what do you think it may happen? So you you maybe uh, you will be as mo uh, you will have as much information as possible so you can have better decisions and not spend a lot of time that you think. But it's a tough problem, it's not a, because it's a human problem at the end of the day. And I think the thing is, there's a problem that needs to be solved. The problem has a cost. Like the fact that a problem exists causes all kinds of extra work that needs to be done, unreadable code, etc. The solution also has problems. It also has a cost. And those costs will be different, because if you don't use static typing, then the cost of not having all those syntax is zero. So any solution that's going to cost you anything is going to be a negative. So we need to make sure that we make clear how big of a problem it really is, and how cost and and, and see how costly the solution is for others, so that we can convince people that yes, this is worth the cost. Now, for the callable syntax, the Sierra Council was unanimous on our own, like not even. Uh, what ignore, not ignoring, but not even considering that uh, the rest of uh, Python dev, that the syntax, the cost of the syntax was just too big for the problem. And I mean, it's a hard thing to say. It's like, yeah, that, that problem isn't important enough to solve. It is important, and we wish we could solve it, but not from the cost of that particular syntax, because it had all kinds of small issues and larger issues, and it, it made complicated rules about precedence and yeah, that's why we decided that particular pet is not worth it. But that doesn't mean that the problem isn't worth solving. We just don't have a good way of solving.